hands and close your eyes. It's half past midnight, and you're listening to the Ghost Story Guys. Welcome to the Ghost Story Guys. I'm Brennan Store. I'm Paul Bestel. And this is the show where we talk about spooks, specters, and all the other things watching us from the shadows beyond the campfire. Some conversations only make sense after the sun has set, and this is most definitely one. Thanks for tuning in. This is episode number 140, and we're coming to you from that tiny mountain cabin you dream about, but can never quite reach. How are you, my friend? I am good. The sun is shining. I am relaxed and refreshed, hunting down ghosts in North Wales, but unfortunately coming up empty. Yes, no ghosts, but many lovely pictures. I was very <laughs> jealous of your of your little time away. <laughs> it was fabulous. It's always nice to go somewhere and have proper fish and chips. Now, we, we sort of associate fish and chips as just a, a British thing. You know, that like, you know, if you, there's a vending machine in your bathroom that dispenses them, but clearly this is not the case. There, you have to go to certain places to get proper fish and chips. The closer to the sea you are is usually the better quality of fish and chips, though that's not always a hard and fast rule though I'm not going to cast aspersions on certain seaside locations. However, the fish and chips we had in North Wales were delicious. Lovely. We're, of course, right on the water here in Victoria, and there is a very famous fish and chip place. I'm not going to say which, uh, but it is uniformly pretty terrible. But it's mm. been around so like Like so many things in Victoria, it's not good. It's just been around so long that people have gotten used to it. Mm. You know. Uh, but there is a great place that opened up down in the harbor. When I was uh, when I was working for the government, that place I will name is called Redfish Bluefish. And mm. uh, back when they first opened, because they had a hell of a time getting zoning from the city because the city sucks, and they're in a shipping container right on the harbor. But one day I was down there, and, and me and my former coworker, who eventually turned into a conspiracy theory uh, nut job, who's now writing policy for the provincial government, so you enjoy that. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, he was the first person to introduce me to Alex Jones back in two thousand seven. Oh, halcyon days. Halcyon days, By yes. By gold! I, I was going to do an Alex Jones voice, I'm too tired. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyways, went down there one day and got the, I, I ordered this back when I could still eat salmon. I got two pieces of, of salmon and chips. Or sorry, I, got, I ordered one piece, but they gave me two. And I, mm. I thought, oh man, I really, I've really hit the jackpot here. This is, you know, a hojillion dollars in free salmon. So I put, I put it down for a second. Which I've learned, Paul, is a rookie mistake at the seaside. Mm. You do not leave your food unattended. Seagull. Seagull. I put it down for just a moment. I went to go get some vinegar for my fries. And like a stuka, this thing just dive bombed and took off with my free piece of salmon. <laughs> writing the scales of justice and depriving me of my, of my purloined meal. Oh, I know. I know. I'm still getting over it. It's been 15 years. I'm still working through the trauma. Yeah. I don't know what they put in the fish and chips. In North Wales, where I've seen some of the biggest seagulls I've ever seen in my life in the last few days. Caw. Thunderbirds, that's what they were. <laughs> yeah. we, we've had that here. A friend of mine once walked out to his car, which had been parked at the beach, and there was a seagull shit so big, it just looked like someone had taken an ice cream cone and turned it upside down on the car. <laughs> yeah. At that point, if, if you'd seen the seagull do that, the car is just his now. You can't, <laughs> you can't fight him for it. He has staked its claim, and you're not going to correct him. Yes, yes. We saw many comical scenes involving seagulls whilst we were there, including an old couple completely oblivious that uh, a golden eagle sized seagull was sunbathing on the top of their car as they were <laughs> busy reading a map and shouting at each other. That's such a great metaphor for the natural world generally. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, thoroughly delicious fish and chips. Lovely. Well, I had a fairly uneventful week. I, I think the day after you and I spoke last, uh, because we recorded episode 141 last week, so that'll be coming out for everyone, uh, you know, in two weeks' time. Uh, but um, I went up and visited some friends at their campsite in uh, just just north of Victoria, about 90 minutes north of Victoria. There's a, a cow place called Cowichan Lake, and some friends from the mainland invited us over or up to their campsite, and yeah, we spent a day. They made us a lovely meal, which uh, frankly was better than many of the meals I make for myself here in my apartment, and they did it <laughs> over a campfire. So it was nice to see them, and then. Uh, Really, I've been, I've been kind of, you and I were talking about this off air. I've been going full tilt with work because I'm trying to get everything ready for when I leave for LA. And Tuesday night after the weird together live stream, I hit the wall. Hmm. I, I might, you might still hear it in my voice listeners. I'm still a little bit there, but talking to Paul is quite literally, it's restorative. So I, I am, I am feeling better just, 
<laughs> just doing the show, but uh, exactly. <laughs> it's a fountain of strength. I draw from him. But <laughs> Ooh, I'll, I'll have to make an app to soothe people. <laughs> we go. Just talking, talking to people about geeky things. Hey, it always works for me, so there's money to be made there. But I, I'm very pleased because the last thing I finished, aside from the Weird Together live stream, the, one of the last things I finished before I hit the wall was our very first audio drama. And that will be out for listeners on the 19th. So a week after this airs, you'll be able to listen to the very first installment of Transmissions from the Void. And that is an adaptation of Brianna Morgan's short story, The Dive, starring our very own Paul Bestel. Amon Mazingo of the Afro Tales podcast, and Lady Merriam, who is a horror producer and friend of the show. And it is, uh, I'm very proud of the work everyone did. It sounds great. Uh, of course, you know, I, the stuff that I did, I'm like, eh, I could probably do that better. But everyone else did a great job. And, uh, oh, and of course, original music by Rainy Days for Ghosts. So it's, uh, it's a ton of fun, a big group effort. And I cannot wait for everyone to hear that on July 19th here on the main Ghost Story Guys feed. You'll get that instead of Book of the Dead next week. So I am very, very excited. So if I'm going to be burned out, Paul, I'm burned out for a good reason, because you guys, you guys killed it with that episode. <laughs> you yes. said you were actually a little nervous before, before it came, or when it came out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always nervous, regardless. I'm never a, a I'm, sometimes I can be too humble, I think, often. But uh, I agree. I don't, I don't like to blow my own trumpet a lot. So I'm always nervous, I, you know. I can't I, reach. I still... <laughs> so it's it, yeah as as with anything i tend to do i still feel deeply humbled when anybody says anything positive about anything i've performed or spoken about or discussed well you did a great ass job my friend and again folks that's transmissions from the void part one the dive that will be out july 19th here on the ghost story guys rss feed and i hope you enjoy it i'm very excited to share it with you but today, Paul, we have a very special show, uh, not as special as having Jim Harold on the show, which was fucking great, mm. but we are going to be, uh, re we're, it was actually, this is a by request show. We had some folks wanting to know, some new listeners, about our personal experiences with the paranormal. And of course, I've talked about this, you know, sort of peppered throughout the back catalog. Um, Paul's talked you know, about a few things on, on various episodes, but if you want to have one solid place where you can listen to all those stories without having to pick through again, like a hundred plus, a hundred plus episodes of backstory. This will be the place where we're going to tell as many of those stories as we can remember. So there's going to be more of a free, uh, free flowing episode than usual, but I'm, I'm really excited because I love telling these stories and I'm, I'm really curious to hear all of Paul's as well. So this is going to be good. Before we get there though, of course, we have to thank our patrons. This one's for the patrons. Patrons, Paul informs me it is Roswell Day today, and so you are the crashed aliens to our government cover-up. Which is to say, the two of us complement each other perfectly, and who's to say what would have happened if we didn't have each other? For real though, we'd of course love to thank all our patrons, but we'd especially like to thank our latest patrons. They are... Miriam Sultan Luisa Gigio Seya Vasquez Vincent Elescas Kimberly Reba, Emma, Amanda Walker, Brandy Martinez, and Kimberly Dara. Guys, thank you so, so much. Everyone who listens to the show helps make Ghost Story Guys what it is, but our patrons are the people who allow this big old machine to keep on rolling. And so thank you from the bottom of our terrible, terrible hearts. If you'd like to join the team, head to patreon.com slash ghost story guys. We'll wait till the end of the show to tell you about all the cool stuff you get, but we will say, for a dollar a month, you get an ad-free feed, and who doesn't want that? Ads suck. So head to patreon.com slash ghost3guys for more info. Shout out to our composer, Rainy Days for Ghosts. Rainy Days for Ghosts is a project of composer and film journalist Jerry Smith. Jerry is open for commissions, so if you need music for your own projects, shoot him an email at rainydaysforghosts at gmail.com. Tell him Ghost Story Guys sent you. Finally, just before we head to the break, one last thing, I want to give a shout out to the Calm History podcast. As I've mentioned before on the show, I like to fall asleep to things like rain videos and stuff like that on YouTube, and I was recently put on to Calm History. It's a new show from Silk Studio Podcasts, and basically it's ASMR and history. So 
every episode takes you to a different point in history. There's uh, one on the history of rubber, Joan of Arc, Henry Ford. I just listened to the one on Jackie Robinson when I was having a real bad anxiety attack, and it was really nice. I had a rain video going, Jack, <laughs> the history of Jackie Robinson, and it's, it's pretty cool. So if you want to check it out, search for Calm History everywhere you get your podcasts, or go to silkpodcasts.com, and I'll put a link to that in the episode notes, and give it a listen. Again, that's Calm History, and you can find that everywhere. Find podcasts live. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Welcome back. As we said before the break, this episode is going to be me and Paul sharing our own personal experiences of the paranormal. Uh, again, I have talked about many of these stories, actually all these stories, at different points on the show, but this will be a kind of a, a sweet little compendium where you can kind of go back to and you want to hear, you know, Paul's or superhero, or I guess technically supervillain origin story, you can hear it there, or my supervillain origin stories, so I'll be here. <laughs> and uh, we, we've styled this one after the... Um, the Black Sabbath greatest hits album, We Sold Our Souls for Rock and Roll. So you'll see the cover is uh, probably a legally actionable ripoff. It's just a ripoff of that. That's all it is. But uh, <laughs> no one tell, I was going to say no one tell Keezer Butler, but I think he's dead. So that should be easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sabbath were never my band, so. Really? You're not a Sabbath guy? Nope. Oh, fascinating. I love Black Sabbath. I don't particularly like Ozzy Osbourne's voice. Interesting. Fair enough. I don't really like anything, to be fair, by Sabbath, which is odd, going with the Prince of Blackmore. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So not even the uh, not even the stuff with uh, with Dio, like yeah, Headless not... Cross or Neon Knights. Yeah, I think they they basically put me off. So I've never invested any time in Sabbath whatsoever. <laughs> oh man, I I love like their first few albums. Uh, I I'm a huge fan. If I'm trying to like plug into work, I'll put on like a massive Sabbath compilation. Mm. And just feed that straight into my brain. So just blast like Lord of this world, symptom of the universe. Actually, Sepultura, heavy metal mm. fans out there. I, I know this is not <laughs> ghost story talk, but bear with me. Sepultura does a brilliant cover of symptom of the universe. So if, if anyone out there likes Sepultura, you like uh, Black Sabbath, check out their cover of symptom of the universe. It is fucking great. Yeah. Anyways, that's all the Black Sabbath talk for this show. Well, I was going to say it was very difficult being a Marvel geek, obviously, with Iron Man. Fair. Although, are the two things really connected? Uh, like Iron Man and Iron Man? Yeah, it's Stark's song, isn't it? Plays it loads. He wears a Sabbath t-shirt as well. Okay, I just feel like if you're listening to the lyrics, it didn't really end well for Iron Man in the song. Some would say that was said to be. Okay, well, if Iron Man comes back as a murderous zombie, then this will all be validated. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still chuckling this week here in the UK, having survived the emotional damage of the last two episodes of Stranger Things. Um, oh, yes. Yes. Uh, well, you know what? I won't spoil it in case we don't have any no. uh, people haven't listened to it yet, but RIP someone very close to my heart. But I found it hilarious this week here in the UK that the normal mainstream media who don't dare, usually dare tip their toe into anything rock orientated were proclaiming that another 80s group was enjoying a, a surge of success thanks to the Stranger Things finale. <laughs> and I was thinking, tell me you don't know anything about modern rock music without telling me. If you think Metallica are an 80s band, you don't know <laughs> anything. Oh, man. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of al There's several albums in the 90s I like to just not exist. But no, that's crazy. I mean, Hardwired to Self-Destruct was what, 2017? They're one of the biggest rock bands in the world and have been for the best part of 30 years. Just absolute was... nonsense when people try and jump on some kind of bandwagon that they've got no idea. I can't believe no media organization doesn't have anybody there that's a metalhead who was just who basically probably sat there shaking his head going, Whoa, why do I work with these people? They know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> He's listening to Merciful Fate and going, Fuck. Our courteous and efficient staff is on call 24 hours a day to serve all your supernatural elimination needs. We're ready to believe you. All right. So our first email comes from Michael. Michael's a longtime listener of the show. Hi, Michael. Hello. 
And Michael says, all terrapins and tortoises are turtles. However, not all turtles are terrapins or tortoises. Terrapins are small freshwater turtles, usually in colder climates. Tortoises are giant turtles from hotter climates. But there's strong symbolism in each. For a lot of natives, the world is carried on a giant terrapin's back, a la Discworld. I did not know that. Mm. Tortoises are traditionally associated with immortality and the wisdom that comes from simply having experienced so much. So that is super cool. And uh, Michael also pointed out that North America is sometimes referred to in the lore as Turtle Island, which again, I had heard of Turtle Island. I did not realize they were referring to North America. Yes. Strangely, I've stumbled across a tortoise today. Really? Eating lettuce in a, in a garden in Eam, the plague village. Good for him. I hope he's mm. having a good day. Yeah, that threw me because he was next to a statue of a, t- a tortoise. So at first, <laughs> I thought they were just garden ornaments. <laughs> right. And then his little head went, Oop, and grabbed onto some lettuce. And I thought, oh. So I st- stood there and watched him for a few seconds, and then his head popped out again, and he carried on. I thought, oh. Amazing. Somebody's got a tortoise in their front garden. Why not? I Unsupervised, can... strangely. That Unsupervised. does seem, that seems dangerous. <laughs> Unsupervised, unsupervised tortoises in the Peak District. That sounds like the name of a very weird porno. <laughs> or p- part of the British horror folk revival. Or that. Could be both. Could be both. There's an unexplored market here, Paul. Our next email is from Sherry. Maybe you just better go along and roll your hoop, Candy says to Curly's wife in Chapter 3 or 4 in Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck. I'm sure bunches of people have brought this up but thought I would pass it along. It's not slang I've ever heard in everyday life. Maybe it was common in the 1930s. It does seem to refer to the old-timey game toy where kids would roll a hoop with a stick. Love the show. Sherry. And yeah, thank you, Sherry. I, that's almost definitely where I read it, because I, I read a bunch of Steinbeck years ago. Uh, East of Eden is still one of my favorite books, but um, I believe I also read Of Mice and Men, which is, is probably where I heard it. Yes, I, I researched it afterwards because I'd forgotten. I actually read that book as part of my English Literature A-level, which I passed. So um, I'm not sure why I didn't remember it. It basically refers to the fact that it's an insult in regards to that they're considering them to be childish. So they yeah. should go and play childish games. All right. Next is Joe. Joe says, I have made it 55 years without ever sending a, quote, fan letter. But I had to let you know I enjoy your show very much. I live in a small town in the mountains of Colorado and own and operate a walking ghost tour during the tourist season. I listen to your show on my 20-minute drive home from hosting a tour at night over two mountain passes. Your wonderful show with with the paranormal and humor easily keeps me awake and away from the edge of the road. It also gives me something to look forward to when I need a little motivation a couple months into tourist season. If you're ever in Durango, Colorado, a tour and a coffee or beer is on me. Joe, that is a deal, my friend. Absolutely. Yes, definitely, because one of the most haunted hotels in in the US is in Durango, I believe, isn't it? Is it the Strata Hotel? That's the one. Loads of different ghosts there. I know there's supposed to be like a old engine railway engineer or something, and obviously the, the usual thing that seems to turn up in a lot of American haunted hotels is little ghost girls. Oh, really? Mm. Yeah, it's got several. So, uh, yeah, any, well, certainly be on my hit list, Joe, so thank you for the invitation. As long as you take me there, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> We'll see you then, Joe. We'll see you then. And I, I know we, we've always said this, we always say this, you know, if, if you happen to be in Victoria or uh, Sheffield and you, want, and you want to meet up, shoot us an email. We'll see if we can make it happen. Yes. And, as uh, I've said before, I will talk ghosts for pale ale. There you go. <laughs> I too will talk ghosts for beer or coffee. <laughs> I like both. Mm, me too. Well, I was actually supposed to meet up with a listener, Lori, on Saturday and Lori had a positive COVID test. So we're not able to do that. So, Laurie, if you're listening, I hope you feel better soon. That is, that it's a shitty deal to happen, have happen on vacation. So, be well. So, next up is an email from Tim. And Tim says, So, like I said, I'm catching up on old episodes on Patreon. And listen to me and Paul, episode 15. At least I think that's the one. Anyway, a listener asked if you guys thought they had ever experienced a paranormal incident. They had never seen anything but they have had their deceased loved ones pop up in dreams. Now, this is something I have experienced, but with only one loved one. Seven-ish years ago, my grandma passed away, which hit me really hard. She was like my second mom. My whole life growing up in our house consisted of me, my sister, my mum and my grandma. She and I were very close, and half the reason I am the man I am today. I'd like to think that I'm a good man, though maybe I'm biased. Anyways, 
about a year or so after her passing, she started to pop up in my dreams. My dreams are always apocalyptic or post-apocalyptic, and I've no clue why they are, but they are. She was never really a part of what's going on in my dreams, though. She would be there in the background. Sometimes she would talk to me, but it was always like she wasn't really supposed to be part of the dream, as cliched as that sounds, and I can't remember whatever she said. This happened probably about 10 or so times over the past seven years until about two years ago. She popped up in a dream, and as clear as day, I can recall what she said to me. I think you've touched on these two next points that I want to mention in your shows previously, because she wasn't like I remembered her. It's like visually she was really familiar, but her personality was like a much younger version that I had never known. But she told me, I hope you have enjoyed getting to talk to me. I have to go now, and I can't come back again. I love you. That was the last time I'd seen her in my dreams. I had to take a break writing this, because I started crying remembering her in that dream, which doesn't at all feel manly being a... <laughs> which doesn't at all... <laughs> which doesn't at all feel manly about being a damp, snotty mess. Nothing wrong with crying, Tim. It's all good. Yes, I have thoughts on this. I'll explain after. <laughs> <laughs> the other point I wanted to touch on was the episode you did ages ago. I can't remember if it was your experience or a listener's, but they said that they thought their loved one that had passed had come to check on them, but left them because they had to move on. Not necessarily to an afterlife, but to helping others during that transition of death. Sorry if I'm misremembering this, but I believe this is what my grandmother has left to do. She was a CNA in life until she couldn't work anymore. I fully believe that if she had the chance to help others in the afterlife, she would. I miss her greatly, and getting over her loss has been incredibly hard, even seven years later. Sorry, I know that was a lot, and this may not be the right venue for listener stories, but I also am not looking for this to make it on the show though you're more than welcome to use it if you'd like. I have to say, though, that listening to your show, when it was you and Ian, and especially now with you and Paul, it helps more than you guys can know. Like, I really get it when people say that, and it warms my heart to hear that you've helped them process or cope, or better understand. I'm not a religious person, but I don't think something needs to be religious in order to be a blessing. And you guys are a blessing for many people. Oh, thank you, Tim. Yeah, thank you very much. And and Tim is a longtime listener, uh, obviously, and longtime patron. Um, Tim, first off, I want to say thank you just for the timing of that, because like I said, I kind of hit a wall Tuesday night, and so I got that message. I believe it was yesterday, or I think it was yesterday, and I didn't make it very far yesterday. I just had no energy whatsoever. But that seeing that message, I know I haven't responded yet, but seeing that message just really perked me up. You know, just kind of it, it reminds me. And I always send this stuff to Paul. It reminds me, me and both of us really that we're doing something good. You know, we might not be the most popular show. We might not be the best show. Um, although I think we are the best show, but that's, that's beside the point. But what we do helps some people. And that's, that's a, an honor and a privilege, man. So thank you. Yeah. And I know I said I have, I have thoughts of the crying thing. And I do. I have thoughts on a lot of this. Um, but before I jump in, Paul, do you, is there anything you wanted to add? No, I'll, I'll wait till you've finished and then I'll, uh, I'll dissect it. Okay. So first on crying, crying is essential. Now we have this weird thing often with dudes, but women do it too, where, you know, crying is somehow a sign of weakness, you know, and that's bullshit. Let me tell you why, because we have it in our heads that since you cannot see emotions, they're not real they're, It's just quote in your head. We well, you know, it's also in your head, your fucking brain. And you know what emotions are? chemical signals in your brain. This shit is just as physical as you doing as anything else your body does. You just don't see the process because it's inside. You don't say like, oh man, I ate a hot, I ate a chili dog and it ripped the shit out of my stomach. You're like, well, that's not possible because I didn't see it happen. No, you recognize cause and effect. But for some reason with shit in the head, we get stupid and we think, oh, well, it's not real. <laughs> Sadness. What am I? Some kind of pussy? No, I'm not doing this. And it's stupid because what happens is your body externalizes all that emotions in other parts of your body. If you don't process that shit, it's like having to take an actual shit. If you don't do it, you just back it up and it makes you miserable. Other parts of your body stop working the way they should. And it just comes out anyways and makes a big fucking mess. So think of crying as like taking a shit for your soul, taking a shit for your brain. 
you got to cry sometimes. And it's, it doesn't mean anything. It's just like, Oh, I'm taking a brain shit. Okay. I'm going to go boohoo a brain shit out. I'll be back. And then I'm going to feel better. And you will, you genuinely will. There is not a single, single thing wrong with crying that goes anyone listening. If you ever find yourself saying, Oh, I can't believe this person's fucking crying. Just stop and go, Oh, right. No, Bren, uncle Bren is right. They're taking a brain shit and this will make you stronger. Denying your emotions does not make you stronger any more than damming up a river makes the dam stronger. The dam is under constant strain. It's just strong enough to withstand the pressure of the water. But eventually, all things break. Nothing is forever. And the dam will break in your head and it's going to end up in either illness or you just being a giant tool to everyone you meet. And that's no fun either way. So no shame in crying. And um, as for the dreams, you know, I, I think it's really interesting because... What Tim has described here is one of the things that to me makes me actually hopeful about the notion of life after death. And here's why. Because I think if this was all bullshit, you know, if visits from, you know, like visits from our family were just figments of our imagination, they would serve all our needs and they would appear exactly the way we want them to appear. So, you know, grandpa would look like grandpa and grandma would look like grandma. And they would be very loving and be exactly like you were when you were a kid, but as an adult. But, and, and you could, so you could say some variation, like, okay, they might have to adjust a little bit because your brain, because you know, your brain recognizes it would be weird to be treated like a child, but it would still give you what you want. But these visitations don't always give you what you want. And in the case of Tim and his grandma, you know, she came to see him, but then she had to go because there was other work that needs to be done. Hmm. And I think... Again, I think if this was all of our, in our heads, that wouldn't happen. I just wouldn't. They would stick around as long as you needed them. They'd be like personal totems. And they would just be, oh, there's grandma. There's, grandpa's always here. Grandma's always here. And they're not. And I think, because it's, it's true, right? Like, no matter how much we love people, no matter how much we love the people in our lives, there comes a time when duty pulls us away. It doesn't matter what that duty is. It doesn't matter if it's work or war or anything. It, there are times when duty pulls us away. And that's, it doesn't mean we love people any less. It just means that there are other things which require us more. And I think it is those absences which gives the time together meaning. And I mean, again, you could argue that the brain sort of intrinsically understands this and feeds this into the dream, but I think, I don't think so. I think that's too, I think that's a little too much, you know, uh, scene setting for a dream. So that really, that, that makes me hopeful. Tim. And, you know, I, I, I'm happy that she made you the man you are. Cause I mean, in all our interactions, you seem like a really cool dude. And I mean that you might be a serial killer in your spare time and I don't know. Sure. But that doesn't <laughs> seem very likely. <laughs> Got to build that in just in case. <laughs> and plus, if there were figments of the imagination, more people would have them. Also this. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think again, that's, I hear this argument all the time in skeptical circles and I, I find it so tiresome. Well, why doesn't everyone have this? Skeptics will say, oh, well, it's kind of bullshit that, you know, grandpa came to see you, but not your sister. Yeah, but maybe they have a relationship with that person. You know, like, I, I don't, I don't understand where this notion of like fairness across the board comes from. You know, this idea, again, like our grandparents and our family, they're not fucking totems. They're not genies. How many of us have good, healthy relationships as equals with our families? Mm. You know, it's, mm. it's, it's a difficult thing to cultivate. Because I know a lot of folks, their, their parents or yeah, their kids grew up and they thought, man, my kid's kind of a shithead, you know, and they don't <laughs> want to spend a lot of time with them. I mean, that's, that's what happened to my grandparents. Uh -huh. You know, I, like Tim, I, I very much identify with you being raised by your grandmother because my, I was like that with my grandfather. You know, uh -huh. I, I've probably said, I, Paul knows this and I can't remember if I've said this on the show before. I'm sure I have. Uh, I don't know about now, but the last time I spoke to my dad and for a long time, he was a drug addict and I haven't spoken to him for almost 20 years. Uh -huh. And, um, I was raised, you know, by my mother and like my grandfather was sort of like my model of what it is to be a man in the world. Mm. So that's, yeah, I, I very much understand what it is to lose that person. And because I've also, yeah, seen my grandfather and he was not the same as he was in life. He was younger and he, yeah, he kind of gave me shit for, for relating to him at first. Like, like I was a little kid, mm. which I thought was, it was interesting, but I'd love to hear your take on this ball. Well, it is very interesting. I agree with that because there is a paranormal experience that I'm going to discuss, which kind of 
falls directly into what you've just referred to there about favoritism and the skeptical argument about, well, if it happens for one, why does it not happen for them all? Um, and we had a very strange pair of occurrences in our family, which were odd to say the least in regards to both what happened and and who they happened to. So it's something I'm always dismissive of when somebody thinks that go I mean it's one of those things well if, if if everybody sees ghosts then we wouldn't have ghost stories would we the 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 thing that captivates experiences and peace people's personal stories is that it's happened to them it's not happened to everybody it's happened to them and obviously you get a lot of cliched stories and run of the mill urban myths that people regurgitate online and stuff but when someone has a very personal experience and finds a channel to relay it either through us or a friend or a partner, someone who, who, who they trust and they can confide in, then I think it's quite cathartic as well. And for people to just kind of pour cold water on it and say, as, as Tim's referring to there, grief's a very strange thing. And for a lot of people, it's very hard to deal with. It's very difficult. And often when people have these visitations, they find it quite calming, reassuring. And it constantly keeps them as though that person clearly felt the same way about them because that's why they keep coming back. And for me, yeah. there is nothing but a positive train of thought for people who have those experiences. And I'm very jealous, actually, because I'm very similar to you. I absolutely worship the ground my grandfather walked on. And sadly, he's been gone far too long. I sometimes shake my head to think it's been 23 years incredibly <laughs> um, yeah. and sadly i was on my way to visit him when he passed away in hospital so i never got oh. to say goodbye um so and i've never seen him since sadly um i would love to um so he's someone i've always aspired to try and be and it took me quite a while to get there but i think i'm on the right path these days and um yeah he was a good guy and anybody that has those kind of experiences and that love and that relationship, in whatever way it is, after someone's passed on that you care about a great deal, I think should be embraced, cherished, and hopefully it will give them nourishment for their soul and lessen that grief as time goes on. I couldn't agree more. You know, we, we, is, we are so grief averse in the modern world, and I don't know if it's because there's no time for it. You know, it's, it takes away from productivity or what it is, but... Mm. It's, it's gross. Cause yeah, we're not really given time to more. I mean, Jesus Christ, we yeah. just went through a mass death incident and we're still really going through a mass death incident mm -hmm. and there's been no time to grieve. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I've had conversations over the years with people who have been talking about other people suffering from grief and they will often say, well, it's been three months. Should yeah. be over it now. What's wrong with them? As though, as yeah. though grief is a, a particular period of time that once you get through that, you're, you're going to be all right. And that's bollocks. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> because everybody's different and everybody deals with grief differently. Some people can deal with it. Some people find it quite a challenge. Some people, it will follow them till the end of their life. It will that's always it. be there. You know, and there are people that I've known my life that I've lost and I still think of them often. And sometimes it makes me feel sad, but it only makes me feel sad because they're not here. It doesn't make me feel yeah. sad and and. and you know, down about it. I mean, I was absolutely devastated when my grandfather passed. I mean, it was very unfortunate because it, I lost two friends two weeks previously as well. So I was basically just a emotion punch bag at that period of my life. So I was a ticking time bomb to say the very least, um, which eventually went off. But that's a different story for another show. Yeah, yes. <laughs> on that subject, and just before we move on, I want to just uh, extend our condolences to Mike Scott one of the hosts of Action for Everyone, Mike's, uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say mm. a friend of mine, but we're, I've been on all these other shows, we're friendly. He lost his dad yesterday, um, unexpectedly as I, as I understand it. So uh, Mike, again, I don't think you know this, but uh, if, you, if you don't listen to Action for Everyone, if you like action movies, fantastic show. It's uh, Mike Scott. Mike is, again, he's a film buff. Um, he's actually got a really interesting day job that I, I won't talk about, but if you listen to his show, he'll mention it. Um, it's Mike, a uh, critic named Vice Victus, who is a former, he's, he's a veteran, I guess you'd say, 
and he is uh, very, very insightful when it comes to film. And uh, the director, Malia, the director Liam O'Donnell, who's directed the two the two Skyline sequels. But it's a very empathetic. Sh- if you like what we do here in terms of talking about feelings and shit like that, but you also like just quote manly action movies, Action for Everyone is the show for you. And I uh, say so just shout out to Mike because yeah, he lost his dad and he's he's been going through some shit lately. So I think we can all we can all identify with that. So, Tim, thank you for giving us the opportunity to have this conversation, and uh, yeah, keep on keeping on, my friend. Now, it's time for the stories. All right, so the first story we're going to tell is is sort of my, again, supervillain origin story, sort of, as far as the paranormal goes. And so, really, I, I had a, f- a couple odd little experiences as a kid. You know, I, I talk about it in my book, Strange Little Place, returning to find bookstores everywhere and sometime in the fall. But, you know, I had my own series of experiences, but just little shit. Nothing that was really dramatic. You know, like, I, I remember going to sleep once and feeling like hands on my back. Another time when I was a really little kid, another time, you know, I was in my mom's basement, uh, or sorry, I was in the basement at my mom's house. You know, I used to hang out down there a lot and I started sleeping mm. down there, kind of turning it into my room because there was a sofa bed, mm. which probably explains my back now. But, <laughs> um, I remember hearing the door open, footsteps coming in and hearing breathing above me. And I thought it was just my mom coming to check on me. So I kept my eyes closed. I didn't move. And then eventually I fell asleep. But when I talked to her the next day, she said to me, no, I, I, you know, I didn't come downstairs. And the only other person at that point was my sister. And it's unlikely that it would have been her. Mm. Not impossible, I guess, but unlikely. But it really wasn't until, you know, some shit happened at Bocce's. And if we have time, I'll tell a little bit of that. And Bocce's was, of course, the family store mm. that we ran from 2000 to 2006. Some stuff happened there. And again, my original apartment, you know, I, I had some, because I lived up there. That was my, my first apartment. And I had some weird stuff happen, you know, but again, nothing, nothing definitive. It was always like, ah, that nothing really happened, but it was creepy. Woo, you know, great <laughs> stories, fun to tell at parties, but nothing, <laughs> nothing I could really pin down. And then when I decided to write Strange in 2012, I was telling all these stories to a friend and, you know, I, I was like, I'm going to write a book. So my very first research trip, I went to Revelstoke and, and it was almost like, it was almost like it was announced. And, and so th- I'll, I'll tell the story this way. So Nick understands me very well. So for 2012, for my birthday, or for Christmas rather, she got me a gift certificate to a driving course down in Portland because she, she, she knows I like to drive. She knows I like to take road trips. So, so I want to say April 2012, I drove down to Portland. I did this driving course, which was amazing. It was like a skid pan driving course. Mm-hmm. So you drive, you, they put you in a car that's got this rig on it that simulates icy conditions and they teach you how to drive in icy conditions, which was great because it saved our, literally saved our lives driving back to Revelstoke a couple times. But mm-hmm. anyways, I decided on that trip, I was going to go check out the, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the hotel now. There's a famous hotel in Portland, which is haunted. Hey, it's me. So turns out I was trying to think of the Heathman Hotel in Portland, the Heathman hotel. Thought I'd save you the trouble of Googling it. All right, back to the story. And I never felt, I'd never kind of t- deliberately tuned in and felt anything s- before, but I went in that hotel and I, I went upstairs and I just felt, again, I, it's, it's hard to explain it, but it was like, like someone had turned on like really loud music, but there was no mm-hmm. sound like standing mm. next to a speaker, that kind of feeling. Yeah. And I, I, and it was, it was only one wing of the hallway, you know, cause it was, the hallway was sort of like an H. So you, the elevator comes up in like the middle part. Then there's like the, the, the left side and the right side. It was only in the right side that I really noticed it. And I had actually thought it was a different room. So when I walked up to this room in particular and I felt this crazy sensation, I thought, oh, why well, must be making it up? Cause it's not actually this room. Mm. But then I researched it later. And it turned out, no, it was not only that room, it goes the entire, right down to the ground floor, apparently. Sort of like a shaft of this weird, uncomfortable energy. Mm. And again, bizarrely, I happened to be in Portland as the same time as this guy from Victoria and his wife. And it turned out they also regularly had paranormal experiences. So 
we we've kind of known each other through social media, but we just had this incredible like moment of connection when we both realized we're down there. They invited me out for a drink and I kind of started sharing some of the stuff with them and they were very open to it. And that was, again, that was like, like, you know, like honestly, like when we were talking earlier, me, me talking about being burned out and you said, yeah, that happens, you know, uh, you know, yeah. going hundred miles an hour, something pops, you know, you kind of rest up and then it gets better. And just again, having someone be like, yeah, this shit is real. And sometimes this stuff happens was very affirming. Mm. So I was heading to Revelstoke and about halfway there, I stopped in the town of, and I can never remember the name of this goddamn town. Uh, I'm just going to look it up very quickly and I'm going to edit this out here. Satan's Hollow. Oh yeah, you've heard of it. <laughs> so I, I can't remember the name of the town anymore. I'm not going to waste a bunch of time looking it up. But I stopped in this, in this little town in Washington state. And it was not far outside of the Colville reservation. Mm. And, um, I re remember reading that there was a haunted campground at the Colville reservation. So I wanted to go check it out. But by the time I pulled into whatever the fuck this town was called, it was really, it was too late. It was dark. And you know, even back then I thought, yeah, I, I'm just not good enough in the woods to bother going into a creepy campground at night. So I went in and did some laundry. Country. What's that? In Bigfoot country, especially. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I didn't even know that back then, but yeah, I just, I just, even my instincts were sharp even then. Like, no, no, this is Bigfoot time now. The sun is down. This is Bigfoot o'clock. <laughs> so instead of doing that, I went and I went to a laundromat and did some laundry and I got talking to a guy there who said, oh yeah, I know the, the, um, campground you mean. He said, it's closed. It's closed for overnight camping. You can't stay there overnight anymore, but he, he didn't know why. So that night I took my fresh laundry, went to my uh, I think it was a roadway in and suites or something like that. It was a motel, went to my motel, crashed out. And I was woken up at around two in the morning by what sounded like an air raid siren. And, and it was just like pulsing on and off. Like I, I genuinely thought, you know, the Russians were coming or something. It, it, it was <laughs> full on like, this is nothing good. So I called the front desk. I couldn't get through. I couldn't get through. Finally got through. And they said, uh, yeah, that's the fire station. Mm. We don't know why it's going off. So I said, oh, okay. You know, I called my mm -hmm. friend in Revelstoke, or uh, I think at that point he was in Victoria. I said, is there something happening in the news I should know about? And he went, no. <laughs> so yeah. I just said, okay, well, it stopped. I went to bed. But the next morning I thought, no, I need to know more. So I went down to the, I actually went down to the, uh, the fire station, which is also, as, as I recall, was also the cop shop. Mm. And I said, uh, hey, um, ah, this sounds crazy, but what was up with uh, the siren last night? And it's a credit to the fact this is a small town that the woman told me, because I think if this was a major city, I would have been very, uh, very <laughs> swiftly told to fuck off. <laughs> but this woman said to me, she said, oh yeah, she said there was a fire, this, this caravan caught fire next to the river. And uh, so the, the department had to respond. I said, oh, is it common to have that thing going all the time? When fires happen, she goes, and this, this woman was probably in her 60s, and she said, oh no, she said, that was weird. She said, um, during the Cold War, she said, what you heard last night. That was the dam break siren for the Grand Coulee Dam. Mm. And uh, she's like, so we were all, all, all of us old timers who were around back then. She said, we're sitting in bed last night going, geez, should we, should we get dressed? You know, is, is, is the dam, has the dam broken? Should we, should we be worried? And of course it was fine, but no, she didn't know why. She was never able to determine why the sirens sounded like that. It just odd thing that happened. So I kept driving. And at one point I was driving through this, uh, high mountain area and I lost cell service, but for some reason, I, <laughs> and I cannot tell you why my friend, I became convinced that my mother was dead, mm. convinced rock solid, convinced my mother was dead. So convinced I pulled over to the side of the road and I sobbed and I sobbed and it wasn't until the, it took the, G, the GPS randomly reset. And I, I, back then I had one of those satellite based GPS that mm. kind of hooked to the, you know, you hooked to the, uh, the, uh, dash and it just, it beeped for some reason and reset. And that kind of shook me out of it. I was, I, all of a sudden I was like, oh shit. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know where that came from. So I kept driving until I got somewhere with cell service, called my mom and she was fine. So anyways, got back to Revelstoke, started researching, started asking people about ghost stories. And like I said, I didn't believe any of this shit. I didn't believe, I didn't actually believe these things were possible. Uh, so I felt real stupid. 
asking people about this stuff. But anyways, I did it. And the first place I went was the, the museum. And well, I didn't realize, we had always been told there was never any indigenous settlement in Revelstoke. That they just mm. said, we never had those people here. The end. But that's not true. It turns out that according to the museum, that the Sinixed people, they lived in the Columbia River Valley, but they, they moved up and down. So they never settled in one place, but they did live there. Yeah. And when, uh, I want to say David Thompson, when he came through in, I want to say 1812, those people were very swiftly moved elsewhere when it was decided like, oh, this is our land. We're going to, we're going to build a jam, a bunch of Jamba Juice and Curves Fitness Centers here at some point. <laughs> These folks were moved and they were all moved to the Colville Reservation. And that's when I realized that moment where I'd had that breakdown, that was on the Colville Reservation. And I remember thinking, well, that's, that's strange. But again, I was still pretty new to this stuff. So I thought, oh, you know, a series of weird coincidences. Okay, fine. <laughs> uh, yes. So I, I got back to Victoria and back then I was working for a company called Cortex. They're gone now, so I can name them. They've, they've, <laughs> they've been absorbed by a larger company. But uh, they were a forestry consultancy. And at the time I was just, I was just kind of temping for them. Uh, I eventually would go on to become the office manager, but that's, that's a whole other story. But anyways, so I was at Cortex and I was talking to the receptionist and we were the only two people in the office that day. So I was telling her all these spooky stories I'd heard from Revelstoke from my trip. And again, you know, whatever, like, Ooh, it's creepy. I had a funny feeling, but you know, whatever. I've had lots of funny feelings in my life. Not all of them in my trousers. And <laughs> <laughs> so as we're talking and now bear in mind, beautiful spring day. It's again, I want to say late April by this point. Uh, we had a 1600 square foot office, so it was quite large. And but, so behind the receptionist was my boss's office to her right was, uh, one of the programmers offices to the right again was now my office. And then, you know, everyone else's was behind us as we're talking, you know, she's telling me some stories from where she's from in Ontario. I'm telling her stories from Revelstoke as she's talking, I see from behind the coat rack in the programmer's office, this all black head peek out and then go back. And I have never in my life seen anything like that before. And dude, I, I, I literally felt the color drain from the day. I had to force myself to ignore it. I'd never mm. had to do anything like that before in my whole life. I had to force myself to go, nope, I didn't just see that. La la la, you can't prove shit. And mm. force myself to like dismiss what I'd seen. But I had absolutely seen an all black head peek out at me, hold just long enough that it made sure I could see it mm. and then go back. Now, bear in mind, I had never heard of shadow people at this point. Yeah. I'd never heard of any of that shit. So what that started was a series of events because the owners of the, of the business, they had a big labradoodle named Saffron <laughs> and Saffron would come into, they bring her to the office sometimes. She had this rope and we would play with her with the rope. But we, what I started noticing is sometimes now sa after this happened, Saffron would, it was like someone was playing with her, but there was no one playing. And the other, the programmer, he had his, this lovely little, I think it was a, beagle named Indy mm. and he hadn't been uh, neutered yet. So it was very, very rambunctious. And I remember <laughs> like all of us. Yes. <laughs> and I remember sitting in my office one day and uh, Mike, this guy, his office was next to mine to my right. And Indy would, um, you know, he, at the back of the, at the very back of the building was a youth drop-in center. So mm. quite often from the back of the building, you could hear like teenagers voices. So yeah. Indy would run off that direction, bark, 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 you know? And then he'd like, you know, his dominance established, he'd walk back into Mike's office. Well, until one time he went bark, 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 and then he yelped. And then he ran back into Mike's office and he did not come out again for the rest of the day. Oh. And I thought, that's weird. Okay. But again, just dismissed it. Was trying definitely not to think about what I'd seen. And then the big one. I want to say mid-May. Again, beautiful spring day, sun was coming through the blinds as much as it can in our basement apartment. And I always say, you know, Nick, Nick generally has, she has grown up jobs. So she actually has to be at work at certain times. I've <laughs> been very lucky in my life. I've generally speaking, I've been, kind of managed to like fudge things so I can kind of turn up whenever the fuck I want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so she, when I woke up then she was gone, that's not uncommon. And I turned to look at the clock, which is on her side of the bed. It was, I want to say it was like eight o'clock. 
And we're like, okay, sure, fine. Or say 8.30, one of the two. I can't remember. Mm. And I, I, so I turned my head back and was laying down and I realized I can see something just out of the corner of my eye on the left side. And I'm like, oh, is there, is there someone there? And it didn't make sense because we both have nightstands on either side mm. of the bed, right? But it was like there was someone standing where the nightstand should be. So I turned to look and that's when I saw it for the first time ever in my life, full body shadow person. Didn't know what it was, just knew that there was a shadows in the shape of a person standing over me. And before I could do anything, it fell across me in the bed. There was nowhere to go. It landed on me and it was like it passed through me. And I felt this electrical charge shoot all through my body. And I, I blacked out and I woke up, I want to say about half an hour later, sun was still shining, glorious day outside. It was half an hour after whatever time it is I'd woken up later or before. And I thought, well, that was, that was weird. Mm. I got up and went about my day, but that marked the beginning of the bleakest depression I have felt at that point, at least since high school. Like I, I really struggled with depression in high school because we didn't really understand what depression was in high school. Yeah. You know, I just assumed like everyone hated me. That just, that's of course that's true. Like, yeah, we, we you know, that's, that's a given. Um, so this was like. <laughs> the worst I'd suffered since high school. And it lasted for about, I want to say a week, mm -hmm. maybe two. Again, a lot of this is fuzzy, like the, the specifics. So I want to be honest about what I, what I don't remember, but it lasted. And I remember driving around and dude, it felt like something, like someone was hanging off my neck. Mm. I would sometimes have these like zombie like moments where yeah. I was just barely functional. And it was mm. like something was hanging off my neck. And it lasted until I provoked a fight with Nikki. Now, this is something I do not do. I hate fighting. I hate fighting. You know, I, I'm very much the kind of person like you can talk this out. There's no need to shout. Um, but for whatever reason, I provoked this argument. And after I did, it was almost like a bubble hit, like a boil had burst. Mm. And this feeling of something hanging off me was gone. So that was it. That was sort of the end of that particular experience. But then a year later, in a roughly about a year later, in May 2013, I went over to Vancouver for a series of shows. It was uh, three concerts over four nights. So the, the first night was actually George Norrie at River Rock Casino. Yeah. So I went with Nick and a friend. And that, it was, I mean, it was interesting. He sang a lot of like oldies and danced with, you know, women and had these odd guests. It was, it was very strange. Like he sang Sea of Love, like a lot of like 50s crooner standards. You sure it wasn't Wayne Newton? Well, he sure thought he was. <laughs> I should be so lucky. <laughs> and then I, I had an off night, and then, so which was Sunday. And then uh, and my, Nick had to go home. My friend had to go home. So it was just me on Sunday. And then I think uh, Monday was a uh, performance of chamber music that was composed by one of my coworkers. So I wanted to go see that. It was at a church, which was lovely. And then the next night was Black Label Society at the Vogue. So it was a very, you know. Uh, you know, sort of a varied kind of weekend. Mm. But on my off night, um, again, when Nick and my friend went home, I, I was renting, this was like a very early version of Airbnb called Flipkey. So mm. I was renting a room in someone's house via this thing called Flipkey because I couldn't afford a hotel. So I was in my room and at the time I was reading, uh, what's it called? The, the, uh, the Third Man Effect, which is of course about that that experience people have in extreme survival conditions where they feel as though there is another person there with them. Yes. Fabulous. Fun, fascinating yeah. subject. Very much so. So I was reading this book and I thought to myself, you know, I'm going to go get a coffee. It was about six o'clock at night. I remember thinking, yeah, I I'm going to go get a coffee. So I walked outside and I heard a voice say, hello there. And I said, uh, I turned to look and there was a, 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 an indigenous man standing there and he was probably, I don't know, in his... 60s, you know, uh, mm -hmm. he was very skinny. He was he was dressed in sort of like a like a track suit, almost like a beat up track suit, if I mm -hmm. remember correctly. He had a, a beat up old gym bag. It was gray over one shoulder, and in his I believe his right hand he had a wooden cane, and it had orange electrical tape wound around the bottom. So I said hello, and he said how are you? And I said oh, I'm I'm well, thank you. I said how are you? And he said well, he said I'm pretty good. He said I could do with a coffee as I go along in my travels here, but he said other than that I'm fine. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, I'm going that direction anyways. Walk with me. I'll, I'll buy you a coffee. So we start walking together. And he had this sort of tick. And it's like a neurological condition almost. It was his face would kind of contort 
from time to time and his, his head would kind of twitch. So we were walking along and I said, I'm Brennan, by the way. And he goes, oh, he said, my name is Dennis. That's oh, nice to meet you, Dennis. He said, would you like to know my spirit name? And I said, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And he said, uh, it's uh, Thunderbird Heartstrong. I said, oh, okay. Okay. And he starts telling me that uh, Thunderbird comes to him sometimes and he wears blue jeans and a white shirt, but his eyes glow. Mm. And Thunderbird gives him messages. And that's because his spirit name is Thunderbird Heartstrong. And he said to me, he said, uh, do you, do you want to know what your spirit name is? And I said, sure. Yeah. And he said, okay. Well, he said, when we get to the coffee shop, I'll ask. He said, cause not everyone has one. I'm like, oh, sure. Why not? Okay. What the hell? Cause bear in mind, I don't believe in any of this. Even yeah. given what I've seen, what I've seen, I just like, sure. I'm buying a crazy man of coffee. <laughs> so we, we get to the Starbucks. The Starbucks is on, um, Davy street. For those of us, for those of our audience who know Vancouver, know the West coast. Davy Street's a very busy street, and so this is again a little after six o'clock on a Sunday night in a, in the spring. Very busy, so we get to the coffee shop. Now I I I've bought coffee for homeless guys before and since. Usually follows a pattern, right? You, they'll ask for a coffee, you give in on the coffee. Sometimes they'll ask for something sweet or a sandwich, and if I can afford it, I'll do that. But then you know, oftentimes if you give in to that, they'll kind of try and get you for a pack of smokes, and that's where I usually draw the line. I just because smokes are expensive. But that's what I expected. I expected that kind of pattern. And instead, he said, I'll have whatever you're having, two cream, one sugar. I'm going to go get us a seat. I thought, oh, okay, sure. So I got our coffee and he ended up getting us a seat outside, right in front of the Starbucks. So we sat down, I handed him his coffee and uh, we started talking. And now the conversation was like two hours long, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing. And to be honest, I don't remember a lot of it. But I will say, you know, he, he, he put the coffee down. He said, now I'm going to find out your spirit name. So he closed his eyes and he kind of did this like him sing songy humming mm. and he opened them back up and he said, you are the stone buffalo. <laughs> I'm like, okay, what's, so what does that mean? He goes, well, stone, because you are a fixed point for people. He's like, you are the thing which the river parts around and people come back to you because you are a source of stability for them. Like you are, you are unmoving. You know, the, the world may change, but you, you do not, you like your values stay fixed. You are up like, yeah. And he said Buffalo, because he said Buffalo is very powerful, but he said Buffalo is not destructive power. It's life-giving power. So th that's why he said, you, you are the stone Buffalo. I'm like, oh, okay. And there was something else in there about smoking. And I, I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but he said something about like you, you always want to smoke or something about that or crave smoke. And to be honest, I crave cigarettes all the time. I've never really been a smoker. Like I actually smoked maybe for two and a half weeks in Morocco until we got out of Morocco. And then it was like, I could taste them again. I thought, no, no, fuck that. And I <laughs> threw them overboard. But yeah, for some reason I, I've always had this like craving and it could just be that my whole family smokes. I grew up around smokers, but yeah. he said like there's something in you that the smoke completes something. So he's like, don't, you don't have to smoke, but he said, don't deny that. So sometimes I will, I, I've said this before, I keep a pack of smokes on my fridge and I've had it for like eight years now or six years. And I just sometimes will go outside and I have an ashtray and I'll light one and I'll leave it in the ashtray. And I don't know why, but that seems to calm or, or satisfy whatever it is I'm, I'm trying to get. Mm. So I don't do it very often, but anyways. So then we sat down and, and he explained to me that he was a shaman. He said, I've, he said he'd been a shaman since he was 16 years old. And he said, I'm also an alcoholic. He said, I'm not trying to hide anything from you. He said, I don't want you to think I'm, I'm trying to... Uh, deceive you. He said, I'm an alcoholic. That's something I struggle with. And that's just who I am. I said, okay, sure. And he told me some other stories. And then I finally, I thought, you know, I'm going to ask him, I'm going to ask him. I thought, I'm, I'm going to tell him the story about what happened and I'm going to see what he thinks. So I told him the story I just told you. Yeah. And he said to me, he says, huh? And he looked very concerned. He said, I don't know why you're having these dreams. And I said, well, it, they actually weren't dreams. And he held up his hand and he said, no, no. He said, it's best if we call them dreams. So no. Okay, sure. But he said, I, I'm going to try and find out. So he, he reached into his bag and he pulled out a translucent purple plastic recorder. You know, the kind of thing kids learn to play hot cross buns on as they yeah. drive their parents nuts. Yeah. Yes. Pulled that out and he blew the same note about 15 times. And he looked around, he shook his head, he muttered something to himself. Then he, he did something else. And again, it's gone from my memory. But the next thing is he did is he reach, reached into his bag, pulled out this plastic maraca. And I remember it was, it was gray, it was plastic, it was faded, and it had Olmeca tequila 
on the side in faded red lettering. <laughs> and I remember thinking even then that if this was like a, a white guy shaman, you know, in Victoria, that thing would be hand carved from wood and I'd be paying six grand for this experience. <laughs> so he kind of shakes it around and again, does sort of a sing songy humming thing. And then he, he mutters to himself something about the doctor or, or doctor. And he puts the maraca back in his bag and he gets up and walks off. And I thought, well, the fuck? Okay. Is he, is he done? Is he leaving? And then he came back a, a moment or so later and there was something green in his left hand. I want to say his left hand. He stood opposite for me and he shoved this green shit in my mouth. It was a plant. He literally shoved it in my mouth. <laughs> and he said, chew that and swallow it down. And now, Paul, I've realized that that was the dividing point in my life. This was absolutely, this was, the, I've had many since, but this was the biggest dividing point in my life because I could do one of two things. I could go, we're done here, old man. Mm -hmm. I'm not eating this shit, whatever it is. Or I could chew the shit, see what happens. So I did. I don't know why, because that was not me back then, but I thought, sure. Okay. So I chewed the shit, swallowed it. And he says, okay. He said, did you, uh, did you swallow it? I said, yeah. He goes, okay, good. He puts some in his own mouth, chews it. Now, bear in mind, listeners, this is all happening in front of a busy Starbucks on a busy <laughs> suburb, a busy urban street on a Sunday evening in the spring. Lots of witnesses. So you can imagine how fucking mortified I was. So he chews this stuff up, grabs my head, pulls me forward, and he goes, blows on the crown of my head. Now I thought, oh, gross. Did he spit a bunch of that shit on me? <laughs> And he had, thank God. Uh, but then he, he waited for a sec, then he pulled me forward again, and he did it again on the base of my neck. Pulled me forward again and did that again all the way down my spine. Sat me back up, looked at me, said, yep, yeah, it's done. He goes and sits down, and uh, I said, so what's done? And he said, just wait. I said, okay, sure, why not? And as I, sit as I sat there, only a couple minutes later, something started happening. And the best way I can describe it is it was like when I, the very first time I, I tried pot brownies and you have that moment where you, all of a sudden your hands don't work anymore and you go, oh, I shouldn't have had those extra ones because it actually was <laughs> working just fine. <laughs> it was like my hands didn't belong to me. It was like my hands were here, but they moved at my suggestion. They, they were not my hands. They moved because I asked them to yeah. move. And all of a sudden I started to panic and it was almost like he knew what I was thinking. Cause he just said, calm down. It's going to be okay. I said, Dennis, <laughs> I think you poisoned me, man. And he's like, nope, I didn't poison you. You're going to be okay. My heart started racing. I thought I was going to pass out. I said, Dennis, I, I think I'm going to pass out, man. He said, you're not going to pass out. Just relax. And I said, I, I feel like if I tried to stand up, I'll, I'll collapse. He goes, no, you won't stand up. You'll see. So I stood up. I was rock solid. I sat back down. And he said, uh, how are you feeling? I said, it's passed. And he goes, okay. Yeah. He said, it's, it's done. And I said, what's, what's done, man. And, and prior to this, I should mention that the St. Paul's hospital is just around the corner. So I was literally planning to like, I can puke some of this stuff up, take it to the hospital, see what it is he poisoned <laughs> me with. Um, <laughs> but then it passed and my, my overdramatic ass had to relax. And I said, so what's done? And he said, well, he said, you had the wrong spirit in you. He said, so I blew it out. I removed it. And what you felt was the new spirit settling in. I said, oh, okay. And he said, now your life is going to change. And he said, I am sorry for that. But he said, I couldn't give you a choice. This had to be done. And I said, what do you mean change? He goes, can't tell you exactly. He said, just your life is going to change. He said, it's not going to be bad change, but your life will change. And that's just an unavoidable side effect of this. And I'm sorry you didn't have a choice in that but you couldn't have a choice. And he said to me, did you ever wonder why your belly swells? And I, I've struggled with my weight my whole life. You know, I'm still very sensitive about it, but I was much more so and much heavier back then. Mm. And I said, well, I assume because I don't, uh, I eat too much and I don't exercise enough. And he sort of gave me a look <laughs> and he said, well, yes. But he said, also, he said, because you have the wrong spirit. He said, that's what happens when you have the wrong spirit. He said, now that I have changed out the spirits, he said, your belly will shrink. And he said, you'll be, you'll be fine. And I said, oh, okay, well, thank you, I guess, for doing this. And he pointed at the coffee. He said, you're welcome. He said, you gave me a gift. This is my gift to you. And he said, how do you feel? 
I said, uh, fine, I feel fine. He goes, okay, well, he said, you're good. And he said, I'm going to go find a drink and you have a great day. And he grabbed his bag and he grabbed his cane and off he walked. And I've, I'm sure he's still f somewhere in Vancouver or possibly he may be dead by now. I hope not, but you know, this is 10 years ago mm -hmm. and he was quite elderly and not in great health at the time. But yeah, he walked away and everyone was staring at me, which is fair. So I got up, grabbed my book, went, um, went back to my room and I, I called Nick and I said, so this is what just happened. And she said, well, how do you feel? And I felt fine. She goes, well, chalk it up to experience and, and just kind of move on. So I, I, I hung out in the room for a while and I was reading my book and finally about, I don't know, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, something like that. I realized, you know, I've barely eaten today. That's probably why, that's why I felt so weird. I've barely eaten today. That's what it is. <laughs> so I decided to go to, uh, what used to be my favorite burger place in Vancouver, Vera's Burger Shack. Vera's Burger Shack is not what it used to be anymore, but I went there and, or sorry, I, I, I so I'm going to go there. So I walked out of the house and immediately I could feel the difference because by now it was, it was nighttime, dark had fallen. And the second I walked outside, I was overwhelmed by the noise. A car passed by me, not going quickly, not going, it wasn't, you know, it's, it didn't have a glass pack motor or, or muffler or anything, just a normal car. But all of a sudden I was terrified. I was aware of every single sound, every single movement. It was just overwhelming. And I thought to myself, if that son of a bitch took my love of cities at night, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> but I managed to get a lid on it. However, I noticed that all the lights were so bright, so mm. bright, so bright. And so again, I managed to get the panic under control. I crossed the street, but I'd looked up Davy street and the hotel, uh, it's a Sandman Inn and Suites. I don't know if it's still there, but it used to be. And it has this big green neon sign on the side of the building and seeing that sign hanging there in the night sky like that. I don't know why it scared the shit out of me. So again, started to panic, had to calm back down. Finally got to Vera's, ordered my usual burger and a, and a Coke. They came and I shit you not, Paul, I didn't know what to do with them. Like I knew objectively, this is food. You mm. eat this, you dick. You've done this a million times. But there was this disconnect between the thought and the action. Yeah. So, so finally I broke off a piece of the burger. I ate it and I thought, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Food. Okay. Fine. Eat that. Took a sip of the soda. I remember thinking, oh, oh, sweet. Okay. <laughs> sure. And so I ate about half the burger and I drank about half the soda and I went home and on the way there, on the way home, I, I smelled the plant that he'd shoved in my mouth because I couldn't identify it before. It was juniper. Mm. He'd shoved these, these juniper leaves in my mouth. And what I've learned since is that I went through a very stripped down version of, an, of a Native American cleansing ceremony, like a very, very stripped, like down and dirty, no, like no pomp, nothing. Just that was mm. what it was. I woke up the next morning and it was over. But ever since then, it hasn't happened in a while, but ever since then, I will sometimes have nights where it's like the glass is out of the window again and everything is very bright. And certainly my life has changed. I mean, the, again, the version of Brennan that started the book could never have been the guy who did all this with the show. I didn't have yeah. the confidence. And I have a fear of heights now. Like I mentioned to you before, I, I went to the Grand Canyon in 2010 with some friends and, and, and Nikki, we went to the, the, the West Rim where they have the glass bridge over, over the Grand Canyon. Right. And I actually laid down like face down on this glass bridge, which was trippy. Uh, but it was fine. Totally fine. Well, 2013 later, uh, yeah, later that year, actually it, funny enough, that was the year I got a hold of my friend, Mike. I'm pretty sure yeah, it was the same year. And, uh. I met him down in Austin, Texas, and that sort of, that formed the basis for the trips that would allow me all these different experiences across America. Like Mike and I have driven, you know, we've driven literally coast to coast You know, we drove from LA to, uh, from New York to LA, mm. you know, and we've done that a couple like variations on that a couple of times. So that sort of marked the beginning of this very strange portion of my, like this even stranger part of my life. And when Mike and I went to the Grand Canyon in 20, later that year, we, we did the, the uh, glass bridge thing. And dude, I, could, I couldn't even walk out on it. I suddenly had a fear of heights. <laughs> Never had it before. And I still kind of have it. I get, I get weak need 
if I go to up to any heights. And again, prior to that, never a problem. I walked across the Karakarita rope bridge, whatever. Yep, let's do this. Again, glass bridge on the Grand Canyon, walked right up to the rim of the Grand Canyon. Fine. But now I couldn't get within 10 feet of the goddamn thing. Hmm. And so I call that, I always call that my accidental exorcism because, <laughs> you know, I didn't start that day expecting, expecting that, but it literally forever changed my life because here I am, right? Again, I never, I was, a, I was the kind of guy, I was very, I was a very capable student, a very good student, but I just couldn't stick with any one thing, mm. you know, and, and I still struggle with it, right? Like I still struggle with attention span and stuff, but I would just never commit to anything for very long because I just mm. thought, yeah, well, if I'm not good at it right away, who cares? And, uh, you know, this is not a real good way to go through life. <laughs> And after that point, like I stuck with the book and it took, I say it took me a few years to do it, but I stuck with the book and I got it published and that led to the show, which has led to me finally finding the thing I actually enjoy doing in life, which I don't think, I don't think would have happened without it. So mm -hmm. that is, that is my accidental exorcism. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay. So we're going to take a quick break for a word from our primary sponsor for this episode, Jim Harold's Campfire. Hello. Hello, Paul. Do you like scary movies? Sure, but I'm more of a scary podcast guy. Uh, oh, okay. Well, I, I can work with that, I guess. What's your favorite scary podcast? Ooh, Jim Harold's Campfire. What's Jim Harold's Campfire? It's a spooky storytelling show hosted by veteran podcaster Jim Harold. The concept is simple. Every week for 90 minutes... Jim will talk to regular people about the strange stuff that's happened to them. They cover ghosts, UFOs, cryptids, and sometimes even things we don't have names for. So these are real stories? They are. Den of Geeks said Jim Harold's campfire is perhaps the best tool we have currently in existence to hear real-life scary stories from other human beings since the actual campfire was invented. Well, that does sound pretty scary. Well, it's certainly scarier than some silly chuff making phone calls sounding like a broken robot. Hey, this voice is plenty scary. This voice is scary. Good lord, that's awful. Download Jim Harold's Campfire everywhere fine podcasts live. As for you... I can see where you're hiding. Time to run, little man. What is wrong with you? The game is afoot. If you like scary stories, and I know you do, make sure to check out Jim Harold's Campfire. Fire away. I think it's one of those things that since I returned to my love of the weird just over four years ago, I think I, I, I never realized just what a paranormal childhood I had, really. We'd often talk about the, the old vicarage across from the graveyard and the church in, the, in my, uh, where I was born. But the more I think about it, the more I, I was deeply steeped in it because obviously I'd got my grandmother who was a white witch and a practicing psychic and friends with the great and good of the British spiritualism movement, which is something that we nobody really talks about in the family anymore. Um, and ironically, out of everything that's ever happened in our family, she's never come back since she passed. Interesting. Some would say that's a good thing in our family. But anyway, she passed away on my 18th birthday and a member of the family said typical. So make of that what you will. It, it's very interesting that I remember some of it, but not mo not some of the juicier things. So we lived in a, you would say, probably very dilapidated converted vicarage. It was split into three separate properties, and we lived. It was very odd. There was kind of, it was kind of like um like two shoe boxes put together, and on, okay. on, on the right hand side there was a a little cot. Behind that was a was a bigger house that ran parallel with our house. And then there was our house kind of sticking out a little bit into this yard area. And everything was sort of fine. And um, it was a typical old house. Like I said, it had a massively long step, wood, old wooden staircase, two bedrooms upstairs, the bathroom. On the to strangely, we had a, a, a toilet on its own between the bedrooms. Okay. And the bath was in my parents bedroom so okay reason. so it was all a bit higgledy piggledy and then one day my 
stepfather decided he was going to sort the front garden out. It wasn't big at all. <laughs> you could say front garden. It was probably a mucky postage stamp, really. And he started clearing the grave, uh, the, the dirt away and everything. And then he just went clang. He said, hmm. Dug a bit more clang. Carried on. Clang. And then he started scraping it back. And there, in the front garden, was a grave. <laughs> so the gravestone was just laid flat in what was pretending to be a front garden <laughs> rather than a small patch of dirt. Um, it's also where I once found the biggest worm I've ever seen. Um, but anyway, that's a different story for a different day. And um, that was the starting point. So from that point, uh -huh. it was almost the discovery of this gravestone, of this tiny child that had passed away in the 1700s. I mean, that, that, you know, 1700s to start with, was the catalyst for something being opened, literally. And from that point on, the house changed completely. The dog would always bark. We had a, we had a red setter called Blue, because we were big on irony in our family. And he, he just started being a bit more boisterous and barking a lot, especially, all, especially through the night. He would bark and bark and bark and wake us all up sometimes, which was always odd, as though he was something that had alerted him. I mean, it wasn't noise or anything. It wasn't a noisy place. It wasn't a noisy street, but he would bark a lot at night, and that was always peculiar. And then we began to notice the usual things, like the floor, uh, the stairs would start to, you could hear the stairs creak as though someone was right. going up and down them fairly regularly. I mean, that would happen near enough every day. You would hear that. And because the way the house was, you could, you could hear it wherever you were downstairs. You could always hear the stairs creaking and the, foot, the footfalls. And then you'd see things would just, you'd just hear a little cling, and then something that had dropped onto the floor in the front room from somewhere. So there'd be like a penny or... Uh, a washer or a, a tiny screw or something would just be there. And it's, it's funny when I look back at certain aspects of things that happened there and we thought they were just accidents or somebody had done something. It sounds a bit odd, but it was just a lot happening. Like we'd get babysitters and they'd do one night and they wouldn't come back. <laughs> and when you're sort of four or five or six, because we, we lived there till I was seven. So the older I got, the more it the more things I started to pay attention of because I was always quite a precocious child. I was deeply interested in things and found things like this fascinating and my family just ennobled it and just allowed me to enjoy ghost stories and scary films and things because they were quite aware that I was able to differentiate between reality and, and fantasy. So they never had any qualms about my reading material or, or the, all the things I watched on television, I was obsessed with sort of Dracula and the Wolfman and Interesting. Frankenstein's monster. Even at like six, I loved them. And Godzilla, especially, was my favorite. So I was quite open-minded anyway. So when my mum used to remind me of the old man that I used to tell her about who sat on my bed every night talking to me, that didn't start until my great-grandfather. My great-grandfather died when I was around two. We found the grave when I was three. I started getting vis visits within weeks of that event, apparently. And he would come oh. every night and talk to me. And I honestly cannot tell you anything he told me at all. I remember one. There's only one incident I remember where he led me to the back window. We had a massive garden at the back that belonged to the house that ran parallel to ours, sadly. A beautiful garden. There was always rabbits in it. I always remember that. And this one particular day, he took me to make have a look at it, and there was tents on it. And I thought, well, that's all odd. Like little tiny triangle tents. And I thought that was strange. And he was telling me that he knew everybody that was in these tents. And I thought, oh, well, that looks, that looks good. And that was it. And that's the only conversation we had that I remember having with this chap, whoever he was. And then after, after this, then things just started to, there was a real momentum to stuff. That's when the, to the toilet started to flush. Right. Um, and things started getting, 
it was clearly people were beginning to think that something odd was going on. Like they'd lock up at night and all the interior doors, they'd come downstairs and like the dog would be out because the dog used to sleep in the kitchen. Right. But it was a massive heavy because the interior, they were all enormous, chunky, old fashioned wood doors with like a drop handle. Right. So you basically had to, you had to knock the handle and press a little like clasp to open the door. So okay. you had to consider the fact that could a dog with paws lift a latch up and press a, a clap and then push the door open at the same time? It's a very committed dog. Very committed. Um, I mean, I know red setters are clever, but I don't think they're that clever. <laughs> so you'd get stuff like that, or the larder door would be wide open as well, because we had a larder in the days right. before fridges <laughs> um, and, and things like that. Or the fire guard would be in the corner of the room and not on the fire. Things like that would, would started happening. And then the bath began to start filling up. Um, always just to the brim. It never overflowed and it was always cold as well, which always was very odd. And then obviously we had the incident where the carpet was rolled up under my, my parents' bed during the night. They never saw anything. And it just continued. And then towards, before we left, I always remember, it was just after, as I, as, as I was telling you the other week, when I had my incident where I flew, I was going to the bathroom at night and I flew across the toilet floor and smashed my face into the, into the basin of the toilet and, and broke my cheekbone. Jesus my Christ, side. no, I don't think I've ever heard that story. No. Oh, so yeah. So I, I, was, I was going to the toilet and then the next thing I remember is just flying and smashing my face. Oh, and there was nothing for me to trip on. And if I had tripped, I'd have landed flat on the face. But I sort of went about eight feet. And I was only like four or five, I think. No, I was five. I think five or six. Yeah, I was definitely a junior sc- uh, infant school. Yeah, I was probably five. And so I went flying and smashed my face, broke my cheekbone. All my face swallowed up like... Jesus. Um, yeah, broke both my cheekbones. I think it's what gives me my, my, my good looks in my old age. <laughs> and um, <laughs> who needs corrective surgery? Just do it yourself, the Barnsley way. So I should have broken my face if I wanted to look good, is what you're telling me. <laughs> Paul, I, this is, I'm getting this information late. It's a matter of opinion. You're talking to a man that's broke his nose eight times. Anything's possible. <laughs> so <laughs> um, <laughs> um, we, we realized we always, there was, there was a door in the toilet and it was like, four foot up the wall. Okay, yep. But there was no steps leading to it. And so it, this was kind of like, after everything was going on, all the adults were saying, oh, well, it's just this, it's just that. Clearly, they thought there was something odd going on, but obviously they didn't want to express that to, to young children. We were never frightened. You were never frightened? No. I don't ever remember being scared there. I was just wondering, like, how did, the, how did these guys square this with themselves? I mean, they, they, as you say, they must have been aware something was going on. Well, my stepfather steadfastly, 100%, was a skeptic of no shadow of a doubt. You could not sway him from anything. Something happened later in life that, in his reasoning, was very strange, but we'll never talk about that incident again because that's Interesting. it. And um, so... They then decided that they would find out what was in this room. So we ended up getting a little footstool and my stepdad and my grandfather went in. We all, I remember being allowed to come in after they checked it, <laughs> make sure it wasn't like booby trapped or something. And so we went in and obviously it was an old servant's quarter from the vicarage. And God knows how long this room had been closed off. So oh. we went up and there was a little staircase, like about six steps. And it went in to a tiny room and it was just covered in dust and muck and filth and cobwebs. And there was a bed with bedclothes on and a, and a pillow and a tiny little table next to it with, a, with, a, with an old candelabra on it. Jesus. And it was just there. And clearly nobody had been in that room for decades because the dust was, I, I remember it distinctly because it was just filthy and everything looked mucky, really, really dirty. And it was just really odd. And so 
we just went, oh, right, okay. The adults went, well, yeah, well, that's strange, right, okay. And they went. <laughs> and we just went back down, went back down these little steps, and that was it. We shut the door. Um, and then within six months, we'd moved. Really? So you never cleaned the room out? You never? Nope. Nope. Fascinating. Yeah. Did you ever get any insight from your mom about what her take on that was? Um, I don't remember my mum being there. Interesting. I remember my stepfather and my granddad being there and me and another adult male, but I can't remember who that was. Fascinating. It was very strange because there was one other incident that happened there uh, um, and it was the only time other than me throwing myself into the toilet that anybody, anybody got hurt there um, was that uh, it was a Sunday and my mum was making dinner and from the kitchen area where the massive door was that the dog could open magically, there yeah. was a there was two stone steps down into the front room, and I had a Bionic Man toy that I loved, a Steve Rogers, and um, somehow it had ended up on the step, and my mum slipped on it and went flying, and she uh, her her big toe imploded essentially, and she's had she's had problems with it for. Ever since it happened, I mean, she had to have the bone just uh, disintegrated. So she had to have Jesus. like a big chunk of bone taken out of the toe. So it's it's always affected her balance and things and 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 stuff. I mean, she's not unstable, but obviously as she's got older. It's got a little bit more problematic. Wow. I didn't. I know for a fact because that was one of my favourite toys. I loved it. It was always near me. So having a younger brother who was a toddler. The, the presumption was that my brother would have put it there. And the more I think of it as an adult, the less it makes sense. So did something put that there? Because nobody saw him do it. And I know for a fact I wouldn't have done that because I always kept my toys quite tidy. Huh. And, if you and ever, then we moved. <laughs> and you, well, it sounds like with good reason, for Christ's sakes. But yeah, like I say, I was never, never frightened at all. Um, and we moved house, and other than a couple of incidents, nothing happened in the, in the house we moved to. So nothing came with us. Um, so by the age of 10, I mean, I think we moved when I was seven, and we moved to a new house, and we had two incidents. Well, we had one incident pretty within, I don't know. Nothing really happened for the first three years, and then I had a really weird incident where I had a very odd dream, say a dream, where I just remember hearing, because there was always this thing as well, there was always this noise in the old house, and it only ever happened once when we moved, where I had the, this, I used to call them the mumblers, and all you could hear was, oh. like you could hear people talking, but you could never make out what, what they were saying at all. And it used to happen a lot in the old house, I remember. But it never used to frighten me. And then when we were in the new house, I remember once suddenly realizing that I was standing up on my pillow and I could do this. And then the next thing, I was being slid like a banana straight into bed. Oh. And I went like that, head on the pillow, boom, fast asleep. Interesting. <laughs> so. Now, as an adult, like as someone with the experience you have in this field, you must have some theories. Well, I used to think it was ghosts, but after doing my show for three years, I'm not too sure no more. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, what, what do we think? Are we talking abduction? Are we talking... I have no idea. I don't, I don't have any sort of recollection of strange lights in the sky or visitors in my room or anything. I've always kind of think... It, it's only because I've listened and, and learned more as an adult that I think, does that really... A ghost? I don't know. It, it might. It, 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 you know, I certainly don't feel that it's anything to do with the abduction phenomenon at all. Right. And I certainly don't have any sort of hidden memories or, you know, because I, I didn't have a, an experience of seeing strange things in the sky until I was a lot older. And, right. and like I've always said, I, I, I'm not saying I saw a UFO, but I know what I didn't see. So, um, I mean, that because was, technically you did see a UFO. It was a literally an unidentified flying object. <laughs> well, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but I don't know. I don't know what it was. So it's um, it was that that was all like then kind of for us as a family, it it kind of stopped once we moved away, and by this point, my grandmother had stopped doing readings and stuff. Her health was extremely bad by by so by the time I was I was ten. I mean, she died when I was eighteen. So by the time. 10 11 she was she was bedridden most of the time she she had a bed in the front room and she didn't do much and we had to sort of help her move about and she was quite you know i think she was 62 when she passed away but you know she smoked oh, wow, too much young. yeah she smoked too much she drank too much so uh you know i was of that era where i'd go to the shop set and put a little note in your hand tell them dot wants this so you'd have yes. this 10 year old running down the street with a packet of cigarettes and a bottle of whiskey happy as larry uh, and nobody bat an eyelid, you know. My grandma used to send me to the store. Uh, we we had a bocce's, which we ended up eventually running one day. It used to be uh, Vince's, and yeah, she would send me to the store to go get her smokes. It was a it was a different time, halcyon days. So whilst all and it was very odd that once all that stopped, that's when my auntie's friendly poltergeist arrived on the scene. It was it was almost as like. It had moved. Something had moved in with them. They changed pubs and moved to a new pub, right? And and then Fred appeared, who who loved dogs. Again, I remember you talking about Fred, but t- tell me more. My auntie and uncle were were licensees in in the in the northwest. They ran pubs in Birkenhead, Chester, Nantwich, and the last one she had before she passed was in Stoke. So there was a lot of trips. Trips to these wonderful cities. I used to love it when they had a pub in Chester because it was a beautiful, beautiful city. Chester, Nantwich is very nice as well. Old fashioned place. I don't remember much about Birkenhead because I was quite young then. I just remember going through the Mersey Tunnel and it was like being in space as a kid. Because <laughs> all you see was these orange flashing lights whoosh, 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 going over your head. But yeah, they had a they had a really friendly poltergeist there. And they all used to call him Fred. It's a, I'm not sure if this is an English thing that a lot of people, if they've got a ghost, they tend to call it Fred some reason i'm not sure because fred's not that common a name these days and he's still when he's people so a lot of people still call ghost fred so he was just a very cheeky playful spirit and i've never come across many cases where people seem to be quite happy to have him i mean he did frighten people my cousin once said there was a very famous probably the best witnessed incident that happened at, at this pub. There's the, they were downstairs. It was three o'clock in the afternoon. The pub was just about to close up because in those days, pubs had to shut at three uh, in the day in England. Um, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. We didn't get 24-hour license until oh, mid nineteen. Well, not 24-hour license. And even being open all day, I think, didn't happen until 95, 96. Yeah. So you just have to close at a certain point in the daytime? Yeah, there was ways around it. If you basically pretended to sell food, you could allow people to drink all day, which a lot of people okay. do. So you'd book a meal for seven o'clock, and then you'd turn up at the pub at three. So by the time it got to seven o'clock, you weren't bothered about your dinner. <laughs> <laughs> which is good, because we didn't have a kitchen. 60 buckets of crush. Um, <laughs> so, let's have a Yorkshire buffet. Um, so they were all down there. There were a couple of guys because they had a kitchen and a bar and everything. So there was two bar staff, my cousin, and two kitchen staff there. And there was a telephone smack in the bottom of the steps for downstairs for the cellar, upstairs for the house, or the flat upstairs for the pub. And they stood there. And then all of a sudden they heard that noise where the old fashioned telephones with the big handle and the dial, it was fixed to the wall. And then all of a sudden, the handle just started moving, came off off its hinge, and just started levitating upwards like a snake. You're kidding. In front of five people. Holy and one shit. of the kitchen staff just started screaming. <laughs> Fair. And then it just went, poof, dropped straight to the floor. But it didn't break the phone. Wow. That's wild. Yeah. Like, that's such a, like, such an, like, in your face. Phenomena, like you, you very rarely hear about that, mm. like that kind of like manipulation of items. Yeah, yeah. He was always pushing glasses down the bar as well. You'd never see it happen. You'd hear it, and then you'd turn around and you'd see that the glass just be tippling, like woo, wobbling as it came to rest. And they used to go, whoosh. you'd hear it go whoosh, down the bar, and then you'd turn around and it would just be there at the end of the bar, just wobbling. 
Never fall off. Never, never went off the end of the bar. And it wasn't like, because I know sometimes if you put a glass on a, if you get a little bit of moisture underneath the, underneath the glass, it'll kind of like slide around. Hey, I, I ran bars for 17 years, you know? So that's why whenever I see paranormal footage of people going, my pub's haunted, look, and you see a glass go, Pfft. if I had a pound for every glass that's blown up in a, in a bar or a club that I've run, I'd have about two and a half grand. <laughs> I've seen them blow up in my hands. I've held glasses and they've just gone. Pfft. It's because you, you, you wash them at super high temperature in a bar in right. the UK. And so these glasses are getting banged about, jostled, dropped, collected. When you stack them, you're putting glass inside glass inside glass. You're scratching them. You're, you're weakening them in certain points that you can't see. And eventually it's going to blow up. So that kind of thing. But with this, this what I've seen that with surface tension where you've got a little bit of liquid on a bar and the glass just moves or rotates or starts to dance about or whatever and moves slightly or it might tip off a bar edge or something. Yeah. These were going 10, 12 feet. Oh, shit. Okay. So, yeah, no, that, that's a different animal entirely. Yeah. And then, it, you know, I remember the time I was walking up and – they had two dogs, Gemma and Tina, uh, who were wonderful dogs. Gemma was a beautiful, both black Labradors. They loved Labradors, my auntie. And, and my first dog as a child, Guinness, <laughs> was, was one of the, uh, Gemma's pups. Uh, beautiful. Beautiful old boy he was. We had him 14 years. Fabulous dog. Uh, 13 years, sorry. But I remember once being there and I walked past my cousin's room and Gemma was, was, was my cousin, one of my cousin's dog so they were inseparable she'd wait for her to come home from school and things she'd sit in the window oh. and she knew when she was coming and stuff and she was just a beautiful sweet little dog so friendly so loving and i walked past and she was she was just on the bed and she looked really happy and then i noticed her fur was moving up and down her back <laughs> like she was being stroked and as i looked Jesus. there was an indentation on the bed next to the dog as though someone was sat there stroking the dog. And the dog looked deliriously happy as a, as a, as a fussy dog that's being stroked and having some attention would look like. <laughs> and then after about a minute, the, the fur stopped moving. The dog looked a bit, mm, and the indentation on the bed just rose up and filled back. The duvet went flat. Wow. And it was done. Shit. And, um, that all kind of happened, you know, like I say. And then from that point on, from uh, sadly my aunt passed away when I was 15 in, in, um, in the 80s, too young. Uh, unfortunately died of, of uh, horrific, horrific cancer. Oh, and, Jesus. Um, I mean, strangely enough, we were looking through some old photos with some friends the other day and there was a picture with her on which was taken in September 1987, which was my grandfather's retirement because he was 60. Um, oh. And she was dead eight months later. Jesus. So uh, uh, it was a very tough time. And I'm sure I've said this before. Our family was never the same after that. But from that point on, nothing really, nothing really happened to me. Obviously, we had the, the incident with the, the car accident five years right. later. That was 1992 that happened. Uh, and probably not far away from the anniversary. It was the beginning of August. 1992, a date that's ingrained in my memory forever. And I forgot when we were talking about this, a little addendum to, to add to the story I told with Jim on the previous episode that slipped my mind when I was thinking about it. After everything that had happened, obviously we were all very distraught and grief stricken. I mean, I didn't sleep for two days. Which, If you ever want a really good sleep to get over a really shocking event, I, I always recommend staying up for two days uh, because sure. you, will, you will sleep like a Disney princess <laughs> after that. <laughs> um, anyway, so we went back to the, the site of the accident and they'd obviously removed the car and cleaned it up and we were just there paying our respects. And I looked on the floor and there was a cassette and it was the cassette I'd given him that week because he liked the tunes I'd got on it. And I'd said, well, you can borrow that cassette if you want. And so we went Jeez. to the scene of the accident 
it was the only cassette that was thrown clear of the vehicle. And so it was almost oh, as wow. if I'd been given it back. Wow, dude. That's, that's heavy. Mm. Yeah. It was a very tough time. Very tough time. Especially dealing with everything that had happened on the night and what I'd said and what had happened. Yeah. And I, I moved to Sheffield four weeks after that happened. And for our listeners who don't know, if you're new to the show, uh, one, hello. Uh, <laughs> this is a very different format than usual, but if you want to hear the stories Paul's, pardon me, if you want to hear the story Paul is referring to, he tells it in episode 139, Shadows Around the Campfire with Jim Harold. And so, yeah, that was basically it for, for the first 20 years of my life. And, and um, it's only in the, you know, after being seriously mentally ill and deciding I needed to save my life that I thought I used to adore this stuff when I was a kid. And who knows? Some people may enjoy what I do. So that's why I've always said ghosts saved my life and probably Bigfoot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gotta, gotta, gotta give a shout out to the big guy. So yeah, that's, 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 that's about it really. That's stuff we saw. I mean, there were other things, you know, family would talk about strange things. And obviously when my auntie passed away, she came back um, to my mum and my stepfather, which is the skeptical event I was talking where right. they were awoken at 4 a.m. because the room had fo- filled up with the smell of Olbus oil that she'd had to take, or they'd, they'd constantly keep right. in her bedroom because she'd got brain cancer. And it was one of the things to try and alleviate, the, you know, give her some additional pain relief was that they would use Olbus oil to create a, uh, an aroma, aromatherapy to try and right. help. And their room filled up at 4 a.m. to the point it was so pungent it woke them both up. Neither of them wow. knew they were both awake at the time. Right. But it woke them both up. And then within seconds, it dissipated. It went completely gone. And the morning after it happened, my stepfather said to my mother, I think we had a visitor in the night. And that was the last time he ever spoke about it. Wow. So even, even he, this skeptic who had, you know, sort of managed to turn away from all those things that happened in your first house. Mm-hmm. Even he couldn't help, but he had to at least acknowledge. Yeah. Wow. But there was also a really odd event that happened at the same time that my uncle was cleaning his kitchen up in the afternoon and he turned around and my aunt's head was there in the kitchen. Oh my God. And she just started screaming at him. Didn't say anything. She just screamed and screamed and screamed and screamed. Oh my God. And then she disappeared. And it absolutely, really, really, really upset him massively because they were very, very close. Sure. They'd never fallen out. They loved each other dearly, as, as some brothers and sisters do. Um, and my uncle was a very, um, was a man that had seen a lot. He'd worked for the Royal Navy, He'd worked right. on reconnaissance photography. He trained U.S. Navy personnel at Pensacola and was seconded from the Royal Navy to the the US Navy for two years and lived in, in at the, the uh, naval base in Pensacola and oh, wow. taught and taught American servicemen the art of reconnaissance and surveillance. So he was a very switched on individual that had uh, served on the Ark Royal and, and been all around the world with the Royal Navy. So he was a man that had seen things that um, he's probably never really spoken about. He's a wonderful man, a deeply intelligent and loving man. Uh, and none of us have ever understood why, why that event occurred to him or why that happened to him. Because if he was any member of our family that that shouldn't have happened to, it was him. <laughs> yeah. You know, man, like that, that raises a great point. And I think it really ties in with what we were talking about with Tim's letter. Um, that, you know, we, we like to think that after someone passes, that you know, they sort of go to their eternal rest and it's all sort of, you know, puppies and, and clouds. And it may be that it is more complex than that. Well, I don't think there's any rhyme or reason to it because, you know, a lot of us in our family would have loved a visit from yeah. my grandfather or my aunt. Obviously not screaming at us. Sure. But, and, but none of us got it. So why did, why, I mean, I'm, my uncle was not a very paranormally slanted person at all. My mum obviously has always been, I mean, I've, I've, I've inherited my stepfather's skeptic and or skeptical 
views of things. And I think you always have to approach any phenomenon in a skeptical slant because often, especially in this day and age, there's a lot of nonsense out there. Sure. Um, but also I'm very open-minded, which I've got from my mother's side of the family. So I, I, I like to think I'm probably 80% believer and 20% skeptic. I, I think that's a good a good ratio because like you said, there is there is a lot of bullshit out there. Yeah. Well, there are certain subjects where that, that differential swings massively. <laughs> <laughs> like Bigfoot's in England. Ah, <sighs> <sighs> oh, yes. well, that's sigh. Or the uh, secret space programs. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's we can all just agree that exists. That's fine. Yeah. As I've always said, I was talking to the, strangely, I was talking on Twitter about this the other week with Adam Benedict from the Pine Barrens Institute and Tobias Wayland from the Singular 14. And I just said to them, I said, can somebody answer me this question? Whenever we get these people who say, I'm in this, I was in the secret space force and I was genetically enhanced. Go on then, show me. <laughs> show me. Yeah, you know, it's 2000, it's two, <laughs> here we are, it's 2022, right? If you say you can jump 20 foot, show me. If you can rip a, rip a phone book up with your bare hands, show me. And why do all these people look like they are the last people anybody would recruit? To be a secret space force, because you know, with the greatest respect, the majority of them I've seen do not look in any shape that they would be chosen to fight anybody. Never mind Martians. That's how they get you. They don't look like they're warriors. <laughs> they don't even look like the kind of people you'd want on your side in a bar brawl. Never mind on another <laughs> planet shooting aliens. Nah, bollocks. I. It, it reminds me of. <laughs> When Nick and I will watch a movie and if something like acrobatic will happen, I'll, I'll say to her, uh, oh, I, oh, I can do that. And she'll say, oh, show me. And I'll say, oh, I, I hurt my back yesterday, but uh, I'll show you soon. You know, you got you got to be patient. I got I, I to gotta heal up first. But yeah, no, as soon as that's done. And, you know, so it just become this running joke. But I know I'm I know I'm lying. I'm <laughs> not trying to get a spot on Geraldo Rivera or, or uh, mm-hmm. you know coast to coast by claiming that no i actually can do all these martial arts moves i yeah. just you know i i tweaked my i tweaked my back yesterday and but don't worry i'll be able to totally do it soon yeah there's a, there is a particular character in the british ufo scene who now claims that he's one of these secret space force recruits oh boy and um i mean to be fair i, I never believed anything he said in the, before this so All right Whenever I see his, whenever I see an article and he's mentioned, I just start laughing because I'm like, oh, what's he made up now? <laughs> and people, st- and it still gets in papers. I mean, good God. All right. Now we're going to take a quick break to pay the bills. So I, I'm mean, for mine, for my next one. I mean, I don't, I, I don't have a lot of that. That's probably the most dramatic thing that's ever happened to me. Although, hmm. That wasn't quite the end of my experience with shadow people. And I don't think I have, I don't think we have the time for me to tell the full story because, you know, it's getting late. But there (laughs) is basically, there is a house in Victoria and I've talked about this house before. It's in James Bay and it's very haunted. And now I had, I first heard about this place because I worked for a woman back in 2012. And when I got into this stuff, she was very good about like being very honest about her experiences. And honestly, like someone who is that professional, uh, being honest with me about this stuff and telling me her experiences, which were pretty dramatic, you know, it really kind of helped shift my perspective aside from my own stories. Mm. And she started telling me about this house that she lived next to, and it was a very haunted place. And, you know, the first time I drove past it was late at night and I drove past it with a friend of mine and, and, you know, I was telling her the stories and. I was expecting to get chills driving past this house and it's a very boring A-frame bungalow. There's nothing Mm. special about it. But instead of getting chills, I felt hot needles all around my neck. Never felt that before. And Mm. that night, both Nikki and I, and now bear in mind, Nikki had gone to bed before hearing the story. So she had not heard about this house yet. She didn't know I'd gone Mm. past it, but we both had nightmares about there being an intruder in our house that night. And so... Uh, a couple months later, some friends from Revelstoke came and I told them stories about this place. They wanted to see it. So I drove them past it in the daytime. And again, it's a very boring house. There's nothing remotely unique about it. And so they looked at it and went, oh, okay. And instead of getting the hot needles, I got what felt like a sinus pressure. It was like someone was pushing down on my brain inside my skull. It's the best way I can explain it. I thought, well, that was weird. 
And that night again, both Nikki and I had nightmares about there being an intruder in our house. So now after I had this experience in 2013 that I've just described where the shaman claimed that, you know, he took out my spirit and put a new one in. Um, in December of that year, Nick's mom came over from England to visit us. And, you know, she likes hearing all these stories. And so I told her about this house and she wanted to see it. Now I had originally decided not to show her because in October of that year, I'd gone for a walk one night. It was about eight o'clock. Nick went to bed early. So I went and bought a coffee and I went for a bit of a stroll and I walked past this place or sorry, mm. I was walking in the neighborhood of this house. And now back then I used to feel very separated from the shit. I didn't really, it's not that I didn't believe it. It was just like, eh, it's when it's not actually happening, it's hard to believe it's real, you know? Mm. So, which I honestly, I think is why a lot of people go ghost hunting and, and all this kind of stuff. But, um, anyways, so I was going to walk past this house, see if I could get any tingle, you know, get, get a, get a buzz off it or something. <laughs> and the house is in, uh, it's on, it's at an intersection or sorry, it's the next house in from an intersection. And I was, I got to the intersection and I was about to turn right and I was going to walk past it, but on the other side of the street, when this voice in my head, and, and it wasn't, it wasn't maybe necessarily a voice, but it was just this really strong intuition. I mean, it was, it was my voice, but it was, it was in my head. It said, don't do that. Please don't do that. And I thought, oh, okay, sure. Well, I guess I'm not going to do that. So instead of walking in front of it, I basically just crossed the street and kept going. So I was on the block it was on but I wasn't in front of it. I wasn't even really, I was probably line of sight of it, I guess, but that's it. But the second I stepped on the block that house was on, I felt like I was walking through molasses. Mm. Strangest thing I'd ever experienced up to that point. It was like, it was difficult to walk. And when I got, when I stepped off the block on the other side, it was gone, but I was exhausted, mm. exhausted. So I, I had, I had resolved I'm not going to do that. I'm not going back to that place. The end. So when Jane came over and she wanted to see this place, I, I originally said no. And then I thought, ah, I'm being a big dramatic bitch. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm you know, I, I pretend like I'm acting like I'm a character in a movie or something. Like it's fine. <laughs> so I just thought, okay, I'll show her. So I took her, we went in the car and we went to the far end of the street and I pointed up the street at her and I showed. I, I said, there it is. And like I said, it's a very boring little bungalow. So she went, oh, okay, sure. And that was it. Except that night, she was in bed. Nick was in bed. It was about two in the morning. And I, I, was, uh, I was laying on the couch, or sitting on the couch, rather. Uh, it was, I had all the lights off, as I often do. And I, I love sitting there in the lights from the Christmas tree. So I had the Christmas mm. tree lights on. And I was sitting there on the couch. And I'll be totally honest with you. I was looking at pictures of naked ladies on my phone. <laughs> That's it. Just looking, but I was looking. So now I wasn't asleep. I was, I was like awake on, I was sitting on the couch, but I was kind of leaning back. But again, I was looking at, I was looking at nudies. And so when the figure stepped out of the hallway, I thought it was Nick because she had just mm. cut her hair really short and it, it was kind of fuzzy on top, but it was a, it was a shadow. It was a shadow of a person. And so when it mm. stepped out, I thought it was her coming to wake me up. And I kind of went, oh, you know, I kind of jumped a little bit because, I mean, she, again, she knows I'm a pervert, but, you know, still, it's, it's quite another thing to be like, oh, hello. Yeah, 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 that's what I'm doing. And to be confronted <laughs> yeah, with her, your sin. Yeah, you're her pervert. Exactly. You get it. So, <laughs> yeah, so I thought it was her. It wasn't her. And the next, now, this is probably the strangest experience of my life because I was awake. I was not asleep. I was awake. But now all of a sudden, I'm laying on my back. My memory literally splits, splits in two because I'm, I'm awake. I'm looking at boobs. My, a figure steps out from the hallway. I assume it's my wife. I look. It's like, oh, yeah, it could be Nick. And then the next thing I know, I'm lying on my back on the couch. And there is a shadow figure standing in the corner of the room in front of the lamp, which is off because it's dark. And it is turning its head left. And right, like it's looking at me and trying to figure something out, but it gets mm. no closer. And I cannot move, cannot move. So I finally, I, I am able to, to sort of break out of it and I scream and I can move and the figure's gone. 
So I thought, well, fuck this noise. I'm going to bed. So I went and got into bed. <laughs> Next morning, I said to Nick, I said, hey, I'm, I'm really sorry if I freaked out you and your mom uh, with my Tarzan yell last night. And she said, what do you mean? And now my wife is a very light sleeper. Mm. And, and uh, neither of them heard anything. And that was the last time I've seen a shadow person up close. I've seen them at a distance a handful of times, usually at night when I'm driving around, which obviously not having a car, I don't, I don't do anymore, or at least not, as, not nearly as much. But uh, yeah, that was the last time. And, and I genuinely think that whatever it is Dennis did, that shaman, it closed the gap in me, in my spirit or whatever you want to call it, that allowed the, that made me vulnerable to these things. Because it followed me home, but it was like it couldn't get in. Mm. And there have been other weird things in the apartment since then. You know, I talked about how um, recently we both kind of went through this period where there was like this peeker, this this thing that would peek out at us from the from the same hallway where I had seen the shadow come out of. Yeah. And, you know, we would sometimes see it. You know, Nick would see it when she was sitting at her desk doing her like drawing. I would see it when I was watching television. And that seems to have, have kind of passed. But there have been other little things, and, and I'm going to tell you about a few more things, you know, but again, for me, it's a lot of little shit. But one of the, I think the most interesting ones was one night in 2015, I believe, I was lying in bed and I guess it was a dream, but my, it was nighttime and I woke up because I heard something moving outside our, our bedroom door, mm. which was closed. And I remember thinking, oh, it's the cat. But then I realized, no, it's not the cat. And I can't, at this time, I think we just had the one cat. We hadn't adopted Bodhi yet. I remember thinking, oh, it's Chewy. But then I realized, like, I heard her, I heard her little, like, kind of chirp squeak come from somewhere else in the apartment. And I realized, no, that's not Chewy. That's someone in the apartment. <laughs> so I got up, I turned on my bedside table, the light on my bed, like, my um, bedside table lamp. And dude, that's when I heard an old, like, an old crone laughing the most horrible horrible laugh and i remember in my dream i ran for the door like i don't know if i thought i was going to tackle this old broad or what i thought was going to happen <laughs> but i woke up and i was still in bed and obviously nothing had happened but that day nick ended up in the hospital mm -hmm. she had a kidney stone yeah and she, that marked the beginning of a lengthy period because it took a long time we ended up having to it was it was a whole thing but it was about two, maybe close to a month, a month worth of like pain and treatment and maybe even a little bit longer. Um, mm. But yeah, it was almost, I, got, I don't necessarily think it was this, but it was almost like something cursed you. Yeah. And you kind of heard it leaving. Yeah. As, yeah, it was, it was very, very strange. And there have been other things like that. Like, I remember one time laying in bed, curled up to Nick. And, and I don't know if you've ever done this. You kind of have at the end of the day, you sort of have a conversation with yourself in your head. Or you kind of imagine, like, I don't know if you've ever had, like, uh, other voices in your head kind of playing out a scenario or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I was having that happen. I had my arm around her and there was a woman's voice in my head. And it was just doing that thing. Again, it was totally normal. Just playing out whatever, blah, blah, blah. And it said to Nikki, and, and it was like, it asked the question, and you're okay with this? And Nikki responded out loud. Mm -hmm. So now these are thoughts I'm having in my head. This is a conversation the voices in Bren's head are having, yeah. you know, kooky old Bren <laughs> getting ready to go to sleep. <laughs> and this voice in my head said, it was, it was clearly directed at Nikki, but it's all happening in my head. And you're okay with this? And Nikki very sleepily went, yes. <laughs> and I'll never forget it. I, I remember there was, I got this blue flat, literally I, my eyes were closed, but my, everything went blue. I can't explain it. It was like this blue flash behind my eyes. Yeah. And then there was another time where I was laying in bed and I heard what sounded like two girls in our living room. And they were, they sounded like probably teenage girls. And I actually thought someone had broken in uh, because it just sounded like they were talking about movies on my, on my movie shelf. Cause I, you know, I'm a big movie nerd and I have a pretty large collection of movies and they were talking about the titles on the shelf. <laughs> and I actually got up cause again, I thought someone had broken into our house and no, no one there, but I absolutely heard two female voices discussing the titles of the various films on my shelf. Like they, they was, it wasn't like they knew they were movies necessarily. They were just discussing the words, if that mm. makes sense. Yeah. 
but it was, it was the oddest thing. And we had a little bit of that at our old place. You know, I, I've talked about this on the show. I've talked about all this on the show before. That's the whole point of this. But, um, <laughs> you know, we, we used to live over on Simcoe street, which is a couple blocks away from where we are now. And I remember one night I was out working on the computer and, uh, you know, Nick came, came out and said to me, now bear in mind, we haven't lived there for 11 years. So this would probably be 12 years ago this happened, but yeah. she came out to, to the living room where I was, where I was, I was writing and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm writing. She goes, well, why'd you come to bed and then leave? Oh. I said, what? I didn't. She said, yeah, you did. <laughs> she said, you, I, the door opened, you walked in, you sat down on your side of the bed and then you got back up. And you left and I heard the door close. Now I had headphones on. I was listening to music, so I couldn't hear any of this, but I had not done any of those things. And that wasn't, that wasn't, like I said, that wasn't the first time that happened because another time I was out of town and Nick literally texted me from the bathroom and she said, um, are you here? I said, no, I'm in Revelstoke. She said, well, I'm in the bathroom. It's, you know, midnight. And I'm pretty sure I just saw someone walk in front of the door. Like, underneath, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, well, call the police. You know, <laughs> that's all you can do. And she said, why? Well, but I didn't hear anyone come in. That's why I thought maybe it was you. Because if someone broke in, they'd have to break in. Because we have like a deadbolt. And uh, at that point, we had one of those click, one of the click knobs on the door itself. Or yeah. sorry, like one of the click locks on the door. You kind of push it in and turn it. Yeah. So the doorknob was locked, the deadbolt was locked, and the chain was locked. But she had, so she, she got up, she looked, checked the whole apartment, no one was there, but she had seen someone walk past the door. And I know another time, like I said, I, I, used, to, I used to drive a lot more, like again, not having a car makes that easy um, to not do that. But one night I, I left the house to go for a drive, and the weirdest thing happened. I opened the front door, the, apartment, the door to our apartment, to the hallway. I walked out. And then I realized I'd forgotten something. See my keys. I was mm. like, oh shit. So I went back inside, grabbed my keys, and I was just about to leave when I had the strangest feeling. I had the strangest feeling that someone had followed me back into the apartment. And the way our apartments work, and I think it's pretty common for apartments in North America, you walk in the door and there's closets to the left, then there's a galley kitchen to the right. And then there's a you walk to there's a, basically right in front of you. You walk past the kitchen, there's a door to the bedroom, and then there's just a tiny little, like a wall that separates the kitchen from the living room. Mm. So I, dude, I kid you not, I walked around that wall 10 times thinking that if I went fast enough, I would see them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, I don't know, you know, like, Tom like and Jerry. Bug, yeah, exactly. Like Tom and Jerry, like fucking Bugs Bunny. <laughs> and I, eventually I, uh, I thought, well, I'm going crazy. So I left, but I got I don't know, two blocks away from the house. And I thought, no, I can't leave the house tonight. I can't leave mm. the house. I can't leave her alone there. And so I came home. And mm. it, again, it, this was all well before the book, you know? So this yeah. was all just weird shit that happened. And, and you just don't think about it, right? Because again, you don't believe, so you don't, hey, you don't think about it. Yeah. But, but then I got working for Cortex, like I said. And after I kind of started accepting this shit, you know, that, and we also started recording the podcast in the Cortex office. Like, mm. thank God the, my bosses were very cool with me and doing all this shit. Cause I literally converted my office at Cortex into a studio. Like I bought padding. I put a blanket up on one of the walls. I put all the microphones in, you know, and they just went, well, Brennan gets all the work done. The company basically still, and this sounds egotistical, but it's true. The company runs because he's here. So we'll yeah. leave him alone to do his shit. Cause, <laughs> cause I, I paid all the bills. I coordinated all the travel. I coordinated mm. all the fu like invoicing. You know, I was, yeah. Um, I, I eventually managed to streamline the processes to the point where they didn't need me anymore, which I was actually very proud of. I managed to get them to the position where they didn't need a receptionist anymore. But anyways, but then when we started recording there, shit started, we really started noticing. Um, but I oh, know I shouldn't say that Bef before that even, ha before I even started recording in the office, we just started noticing weird shit happening. Mm. Like I would hang out there after hours. Cause again, it's a big office. I got the keys to myself. Um, half the time the bosses lived in their house on protection Island. I would say 75% of the time they live there, which is, it's a small Island. You have to drive about two hours North 
to get to the terminal and that it's a passenger only ferry that only runs during certain times of the day. So Mm -hmm. they were never in the office. So I would go to the office and hang out. I'd watch movies. But what I started noticing is that some nights were darker than others. And some nights it felt like you were being watched. Mm. And I remember one night a friend joined me. We were hanging out in the office watching a movie. (laughs) And we looked into my boss's office and it was pitch black. And I thought, eh, okay, well, you know, Doug must have closed his curtains before he left. Yeah. And then we looked again a moment later. Nope. Those curtains were open and the street light, the light from the street light was completely filling the room. Something had been blocking our vision. Oh. Yeah. And that would happen a lot. It was almost like you were attracting the notice of something. You know, they would, they would dip in and out and it started to become really hostile. Like it, it, it started to become really unpleasant past a certain point in the night. So yeah, I, I remember after 1030 or so, it, it was like, it didn't, 1030 was like, eh, okay, fine. And then after 11, after a while, it was like, it, I don't want you here anymore because it just, it, it's hard to explain exactly how it felt. It just felt hostile. And what I discovered after speaking to, to my boss or one of my bosses is she had started to feel this as well. And she had always felt this if she was working there by herself. And what's interesting is I'd purchased uh, magnetite rocks. I think it's magnetite. It's like, um, it's, they're basically like rocks with iron filings on them. So I, I'd purchased like these magnetite rocks because I, I remember reading about iron horseshoes, right? People would put them above their door. Yes. <laughs> so, I, so I thought, well, it's not the horseshoes, it's the iron. So I went and bought the rocks I could find with the highest iron content. <laughs> and I put one above, the, uh, one above the front door and one above my office door. Mm. But what I didn't count on, and this is something my boss told me, she said, whatever is happening, Brennan, she said, it's coming from the back of the office, which is where the dog was barking at. <laughs> and that makes sense because the office, the building is in Bastion Square. Bastion Square is where the public executions used to take place. Uh, it was the former site of a prison. Yeah. And there are, there are, I mean, if you do like the ghost story, the, the ghost tour office, you know, they're like big, the place where they do their big finish. It's in Bastion Square. It's not far from the office, from my office. Mm. So that place is covered with ghosts, but it, it would start there. and. Again, it, you know, I remember being called one night by the security team because, you know, I was the guy on call for, for any kind of security breach and they had picked up motion. They picked up <laughs> motion in the office. Yeah. And so I went in, which, oh, pardon me. No, sorry. They said, we tried to go in, but the key in the key well, which is sort of what they used to get access, the key wouldn't work. <laughs> it wouldn't open the door. So I went and checked the key in the key well. It worked fine. <laughs> it's just for whatever reason that night something was moving through the office and it didn't want anyone else getting in and we checked we because ch- we thought maybe the security system is set too sensitive you know mm. sometimes if you've got a really sensitive system even a warm air current can set off the motion detector but uh no it was yep. set to the least sensitive setting and it still went off it still detected mm. some kind of motion and it was at that point I started noticing something else, which is it didn't like you talking about it. Mm. And now I told the story recently on the show, so I'll go through this part quickly, but basically I was describing all this stuff to my cousin who, you know, has very, 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 very graciously come along with me on this journey of insanity that, that has been the last 10 years of my life. And we were, I was talking to him on my, it was an iPhone at this point. So it's in my office. And we're talking about, I started telling him, reception had been totally fine. Mm. And then I started talking about all the spooky shit. And I started losing him. And it started drifting. And I thought, ah, stupid phones, you know, whatever. Didn't think anything Mm. of it. But then it, it really started to, I really started to lose him. And we started to get this interference. And then after the interference, I heard a voice. And that voice went, (laughs) <laughs> now bear in mind this is an iphone signal so i don't think you have break-ins but i don't know but i hung up i called him back and i said so what what were you saying back then and he said dude i thought that was you 
So I started talking again about the spooky shit. He started losing them. So I stepped outside because again, I'm the only one in the office and it was fine. Totally fine. So we're telling him spooky, whatever. Okay. And like, oh, fine. Okay. So it's working again. Go back in the office, start talking about other shit. Oh, works fine. Phones seems to have worked. And, and then I remembered, oh, I forgot to tell him about this one thing. So I go back to how spooky the office is and we start losing connection again. <laughs> So I decided to try an experiment. I literally went, okay, let's change the subject back to normal shit. The uh, interference went away. <laughs> so it just didn't seem to enjoy being talked about. And we had other little stuff, you know, like um, the battery and the security system, the backup battery would run down much faster than it should or would burn yeah. out much faster than it should. And I think the most dramatic thing that happened in that office was one night I was planning to, I was actually just planning to stop it and use the can. Mm. So I, the parking, the adjacent parkade has a, a door connecting it to the, on the third floor, connecting to the third floor of that building. And yeah. so we, uh, we, my friend and I parked on the third floor right next to the door, went in. The first thing we noticed is that the hallway going down, going to the stair, the grand staircase, much darker than it should be. Mm. It, I mean, the lights were off, sure, but it was also darker. Than, it sh than even that should be. So we walked into the hallway and we get to the door that goes to the grand staircase and we both start feeling the hair go up on our arms. Mm. And we walk into the grand staircase. I look over the, the, uh, over the, the banister of the stairs down to the second floor landing. Now bear in mind the, on the left side of the, of the grand staircase, it's all stained glass and there are streetlights yeah. opposite stained glass. So there's, there's a lot of light comes through even at night. Yeah. It would not illuminate the landing in front of our office. It was pitch black. It was like a mass was sitting there. Mm. And I, and I, I, my friend and I both said, nope, nope. So we walked back out and we're standing there and we're going, this is stupid. This is stupid. You know, I, I just got to take a piss. Like this is, this should not be this hard. So go back inside. We didn't even get as close as we got last time before the hairs went up, the goosebumps went up. And we both thought, you know what? This isn't worth it. That whatever's happening here is getting stronger. So we're just going to leave. Forget it. And then as we're, we're, we're standing outside the, uh, we're standing in the parkade now outside the office, but we've got the connective door, the connecting door open. And as we're standing there looking at each other, like, is this really happening? Are we really experiencing this? We felt this rush of hot air blow past us. And we thought, well, that was odd, but maybe the furnace has kicked on. Mm. But then that same rush of hot air passed us again, going the other way. <laughs> and as we watched those heavy shadows receded like a tide mm. pulled the shadows, pulled back down the hallway and around the corner. And then it was, it was just a normal amount of dark. <laughs> and we thought, okay, fuck this. And we got in the car <laughs> and we found, a, I, I ended up using one of the public washrooms on the street. Um, but yeah, it was, I'd never experienced that before. Like it literally, we saw the darkness recede and I didn't see anything like that again until I was in Revelstoke yeah, mm. when, um, and again, I've told the story recently, so I'll be quick, but I was driving around with a friend of mine and you know, there's this place, it used to be this place, you go south of town, uh, again, the Arrow Lakes, south of Revelstoke, there used to be a bunch of, a bunch of small towns down there, but they started damming up the Columbia River in the 60s, so a lot of those towns were moved, and what was left was flooded. Mm. And so, it used to be you could drive all the way down to this town called Arrowhead, you know, and there was a ferry down at a place called 12 Mile. Yeah. Now, it, when the weather's good, you can still get to 12 Mile, and it's, it's really quite pretty. But- at night, you usually get about as far as it's called Green Slide, Green Slide Road. And that's where the pavement stops. And usually at night, that's where Bren stops too, because it's dark as fuck. <laughs> but this one particular night, I was out for a drive with my friend. And I was, this was me back visiting Revelstoke. And my friend and I say we were driving and we got to green slide because you know, there's only so many places to drive in Revelstoke. It's pretty small. Mm. So we get to the, we get down to green slide and dude, it was brighter than I've ever seen it. It was clearer than I've ever seen it. Yeah. And I said to my friend, I said, you want, we should keep going. 
I've never seen the valley, the river valley at nighttime. Like it, I've never seen it like this. It was beautiful. So we just kept going and the sky was clear. The trees were clear. It was amazing. There's stars everywhere. We kept going and then eventually the valley opened up and you could see all the way down. Uh, you could see the mountains in the distance. This, again, the valley full of stars. I'd never felt safe enough. And I didn't realize that's what I was feeling, but I'd never felt safe enough to do this before. And it was wild. And I remember thinking, holy shit. So we kept going, we kept going. And then I felt something change. I don't know what it was exactly, but I felt something shift. And then I looked in the distance and just the same way I saw darkness receding, like it was being pulled back, I saw darkness filling this valley back up, mm. turning it back to what it usually is at nighttime. And it was flooding down the valley towards us. And I turned the car around and I started driving. And my friend said to me, she goes, uh, what's up? And I said, oh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, says it was time to go. She goes, oh, it's okay. That's weird. And, uh, I said, yeah. <laughs> and now my friend is not at all sensitive to the shit at all. You know, the, the night her and I had to sleep in the car, um, in the middle of nowhere because we got stuck behind a bunch of mudslides, you know, <laughs> she literally just curled up into a ball and went to sleep. Whereas I was awake for ages. You know, because I could feel something not quite right around the car. Yeah. Uh, but this night we're driving away and she looked at me and she said, kind of creeped out right now. What's going on? And I said, I'll explain later. But we couldn't go fast. L literally the darkness overtook us. Mm. And the trees around us filled with shadows. And all of a sudden, in an instant, it was exactly the way it always looks, which is pitch black and very unwelcoming. Mm -hmm. And dude, it was almost like something was gone. Yeah. And, and it felt us. Realized you were there. Yeah, exactly. And it came back. And I, I have since had reason to believe there might be something substantial and very old living in that valley. Mm. Um, there's a story, the very short version of it is, um, there's a, I read a book called Other Worlds by Derek Luke. I think it's Derek Luke. He talks about uh, DMT experimentation, hallucinogenic experimentation, basically. Mm. And one of the things he says is he says that, um, like hallucinogenic experimentation, DMT, DMT experimentation, you know, people claim that, you know, when you're hallucinating from something like DMT, you are really just seeing the inside of your eyes. Mm. You're just seeing the patterns of the optic nerve. And so his claim in this book was that, well, no, that, that's not true because the optic nerve doesn't look like that. Yeah. And he tells a story in the book about doing DMT. This guy had done it more than 40 times. And for, for our listeners who don't know, DMT is a, it's a hallucinogenic substance. It's a naturally occurring substance. I, they believe our body produces certain amounts of it, certain, certain amounts of it endogenously. Yeah. They think this is what possibly makes us dream, but you can smoke it. And so he smoked it on the banks of the Ganges River. He'd done it 40 times, 40 sometimes, many, many times. And he was immediately, he felt himself go somewhere. And now, uh, listeners, some people believe that when you smoke DMT, you are more than any other hallucinogen, you are, your consciousness is going somewhere. And it's mm -hmm. going somewhere that you're not actually welcome in some cases. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes it's believed you can go to places that you shouldn't be able to access. Yeah. And there are many stories of people being told by creatures like, you shouldn't be here. So this guy did this and he saw this rift. And beyond the rift was a place he couldn't describe. It was beautiful, but he couldn't get his mind around what he was seeing. And then he realized that between him and this ineffable thing on the other side of the rift mm. was the serpent. And the serpent had many, many, many countless limbs and tentacles. Mm. And on each tentacle was countless eyes. And he said, this thing became aware of him and it started to undulate almost like to, like it was dancing, like it was trying to distract him because yeah. he was somewhere he shouldn't be. And he was seeing something he shouldn't see. And now I, again, I, I'm a little soft on the specifics. It's been a while since I've read it. I've got it here, but basically when he woke back up, that experience was so intense. He didn't do DMT for another 10 years. Wow. 
and he learned that, you know, the, the where he had done this DMT on the banks of the Ganges was near the border with Tibet. Hmm. And there is a legend in Tibetan lore of a thing called Za, G-Z-A. And it is a, it is a many-limbed, many-eyed serpent that guards the, 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 the basically guards the, the gate between worlds. Mm. And they live in river valleys. And I, as kooky as it sounds, I have come to believe that such a thing lives in the river valley, so the Revelstoke. Yeah. And I think that what we saw that night, I think we saw it coming back because I think that whatever is there, some people are fine, but there are certain people who have certain attributes. I don't know what they are, but mm -hmm. they will call it like a certain psychic weight. And yeah. they are the ones, almost like a spider in a web, you vibrate the string at just the right frequency to attract its attention. Yeah. And I think that's what happened that night. I think we attracted its attention and it came back to see what was going on. Mm. Wow. So that's, um, that's another sort of collection of, of Bren's, Bren's cavalcade of weird shit. <laughs> Before we get to our last story, we have one final ad break. Remember, if you sign up at patreon.com slash ghost story guys for even as little as $1 a month, you don't have to hear ads. So one of the strangest events didn't actually happen to me despite the, well, something odd did happen to me at this point, but there's a, there's an odd bit of synchronicity here, which may make you chuckle. So a few years ago, it was my 40th and we decided that we would go to Bridlington for a golf trip. So six of us went for, for three days. We went there for Friday night, Saturday night, came back Sunday. And we booked a hotel, which I will mention the name of later in this story. And so we went, and the first night was fairly uneventful. We had a nice night, had a, had a great round of golf, lovely, beautiful, scenic views on the, on the East Yorkshire coast. Fabulous, really nice. Weather was glorious as well. Came back, lovely food at the hotel, few drinks, everybody went to bed. Day after, we went playing golf. We had one of those wonderful things that happened on the East Coast where we had four seasons in 10 minutes <laughs> where, where it was glory, red hot, and then the sky went black. We had a thunderstorm, tipped it down with rain, lightning. Holy shit. Gold kicking off. And then it started hailing like <laughs> nobody's business, and we all had to hide. On the ground, Jeez. but we couldn't put his umbrellas up because obviously it was still lightning as well. Oh. So we're going to get struck, so we're all like there. I think I've still got it on. I think I uploaded it on Facebook when it happened. So if it, if it comes around on my birthday, I'll tag you in it so you can see Sweet. it because it's crazy. <laughs> and you can see one of my mates screaming as the hail is bashing on his head. <laughs> ah, we're all like that. And then it rained again. And then it just went, Poof, and it was red hot. Anyway, so... Sat the same again, get back. We all have a lovely meal. We go out for a couple of drinks in a couple of other places. Gets back to the hotel. Everybody's bushed. You know, we're, we're getting on. Two days of exercise and drinking takes its toll after a certain age. And um, <laughs> anyway, so Sunday morning we gets up and we're sat downstairs having, having his breakfast. And my brother comes down and he says, I tell you, this, this hotel's haunted. Why, why, what do you on about? And he's and he, there was my brother was stopping with his his best mate at the time, a guy called Scott. Uh, well, still best mate. And um, he says, "Yeah, it was really odd." He says, "I just woke up and saw him flying out the bed." And I said, "What do you mean flying out the bed?" And my brother said that he woke up in the morning and realised that. Um, about three o'clock, he just felt himself sliding feet first out of the bed, not rolling out of the bed. He was being pulled out of the bed by his feet. Okay. And he was basically pull, pulled feet first out of the bed onto the floor. <laughs> oh, and his Jesus. friend woke up whilst it was happening and saw him sliding out of the bed. Wow. And he's like, what, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing that? That's all a bit strange. And we're like, yeah, this, this is really odd. So he's like, yeah, he said, I just woke up 
he said, with this feeling of, of, it just didn't feel right. And then the next thing I remember thinking, hang on, and <laughs> sliding, <laughs> sliding out of the bed and he was pulled feet first out of the bed onto the floor. So I say, are you sure you didn't roll over? And he went, no, 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 it was feet first. And he ended up being pulled out of the bed and laid in front of the, the, the bathroom door and the, and the door to the room. He was laid on the floor in front of it. And he was like, and then I just got back up, picked his duvet back up, got back into bed and he laid there for 10, 15 minutes and then he, he managed to drop off. So I'm like, oh, this is a bit strange. So we go, right, well, we've got to get packed up because we're going to get all his gear, check out, play the last round of golf, head home. So at the point, I'd taken a, a book, Colin Wilson's Poltergeist, with me for a bit of light right. reading, as you do. Um, and I got upstairs and I thought, oh, this is a bit odd. It's not, it's not my bedside table anymore. The book's gone. So I'm thinking, well, it was, it was there when I went to sleep. But it's not there now. Nobody had been in the room from us coming down for breakfast to going back to the room. It, it, it had just vanished. So anyway, we're checking all the room and we're opening the drawers and I'm, you know, I'm even looking. And I mean, it's a thick book. It wouldn't have, wouldn't have fitted under the bed anyway. I was going to say, lift- yeah, those are not small books. Yeah. So I'm lifting the bed up anyway. It's not there. It's not, it's not in the drawers. It's not, I've not already packed it. It's not, so I'm not even like lifting the pillows up thinking, I'm put it in bed. Is it in the duvet? What's, what's going on? Anyway. So I just think, so oh, well, there's a, there's a table, bedside table. And I just thought, oh, well, I'll have a look. And it was like propped in a corner, so there was a gap behind it. So I just looked over, and the book was there, stood up on its end, and it looked like it had been in somebody's attic for 10 years. It was covered in dust and cobwebs. Really? Yeah. And at first I'm thinking, is somebody, somebody pulling me like, you know, it's a book on poltergeists. If you want to try and go, ooh, look at this, this is spooky. But when I pulled it out, it was filthy. It literally looked like it had been chucked in a, in a Hoover bag and shaken about him. All the cover was covered in muck and cobwebs and everything. It looked, like I say, like it had been in an attic. And I'm just thinking, well, my brother's just told me this weird story. And we talked about it the rest of the day. We couldn't get his head around it. And I was saying, well, maybe my bit's a bit strange, but I still couldn't get my head around why. Because there was no cobwebs behind this cupboard. The room was spotless. It was a lovely room. There was, you know, there was no cobwebs there for it to, to, for it to have got there. And also it was at the front of the desk and there was a lamp and other stuff on the side. There was no way the book could have flipped without knocking the lamp over. Everything would, behind, right. would end up behind the cupboard. And I couldn't have knocked it off because if I'd have knocked it off, I'd have knocked everything else off. So we never, we never made any sense of it. And my brother ended up emailing the hotel and saying, is it haunted? Da, 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 da. Never got a reply. You know what the name of the hotel was? Huh. The Revelstoke. No fucking way. Yeah. The Revelstoke in Bridlington. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> ah! Well, I, I can't think of any better note to end on. Holy shit. You, the, that part of the story you've never told me before. <laughs> exactly. Oh, amazing. I was saving it for a rainy day. You can, you can Google it. You can check. And I would say the food there was amazing. We weren't expecting anything. It was a lovely old Art Deco hotel. If you Google the Revelstoke Hotel Bridlington, hopefully they've survived the pandemic. I'm not sure if they did. But, uh, yeah. Amazing. The Revelstoke Hotel. I, can't get my, I cannot get over that. <laughs> There you are. I always know how to finish. Uh, no kidding. Holy shit. <laughs> and it's sort of fascinating that your brother had the same experience as you did in a way, but instead of being placed into bed, he was taken he was out of bed. Out. Yeah. 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 And the fact that his, his mate saw it happen as well, he saw the oh, sort that, of yeah. end of it. That's it. Because he was like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> they pulled <laughs> yeah. out of bed. <laughs> I have no control over this, you son of a bitch. <laughs> so, yeah. Jesus. Amazing. Well, folks, those are some of our personal paranormal encounters. This is going to be a very long fucking show. I, we, we've been recording for three hours. Seven days. Yeah, they're about, yeah, three. I think it's actually our longest session in a very long time. Three hours mm-hmm. and 15 minutes. We haven't even done the C segment yet. It is past one in the morning where Paul is. So we <laughs> hope you enjoyed this. It's certainly, it's been restorative for me. I feel so much better. 
than I did uh, at the beginning of the day and have for the last several days. Good. So we will be back. Uh, episode 141 will be, well, we'll talk all about all that shit here in the C segment. So we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Hey there, listeners. Before you reach for that skip 15 seconds ahead button, I promise you this isn't an ad. We wanted to take a minute to talk to you about mental health. On this show, I've always tried to be as honest and open as possible about my struggles with depression and anxiety, because even though we've come a long way towards acknowledging the very real damage these things can do, there is still way too much lingering stigma about reaching out for help. And when you start to feel like there's no help, it's easy to start feeling like there's no hope. But Paul has joined me today to remind you there is always hope and there's always help. We're not going to try and talk you out of self-harming right now because we know that's not how it works. Instead, what we wanted to do was tell you something now and hope that should things get bad, you'll remember it and make a phone call or send a text message before you make any permanent decisions. As someone who knows all too well just how important mental health can be. It's never too late to reach out. In Canada, the number to call is 133-456-4566. In the USA, the number to call is 1-800-273-8255. In the UK, the number to call is 116-123 or text SHOUT. That's S-H-O-U-T to 85258. In Australia, the number to call is 131114. However bad shit seems, it will pass. And no matter what your brain might be telling you at any given moment, and believe me when I say I know this intimately, there are people who love you and people who care deeply about how you treat yourself. Should a time come when you find yourself despairing, Please know that we've both been where you are, and there is a way back to the world. Take care. Welcome back. Thanks, as always, to Luke, Anthony, Sarah, and Joseph, and everyone else who's part of the Ghost Story Guys family. Don't forget to check out Luke's podcast, Luke Lore, now part of the Connected Podcasts Network, and the live stream that I do with Joseph, Weird Together, which you can find uh, via link in the show notes. Our last episode, we covered the 2021 horror film, Demonic, and of which I am the only fan. No one else seems to like that movie, including Joseph, but I will defend it till my dying day because it scared the shit out of me, and I have seen it four times. Again, that is a live stream. Uh, patrons of the Ghost Story Guys, they get the audio version, and there, it will possibly be its own separate thing audio-wise one day, but not right now. So if you want to hear Weird Together, uh, pay, become a patron of the Ghost Story Guys, or check out the, uh, check out the web stream online. And of course... Thanks to you, my friend and co-host, the Iron Man himself, still cracking after a day of work at uh, 1.15 in the morning, like a goddamn Ooh. machine. Paul Bestel, host of Mysteries and Monsters, the paranormal Johnny Carson. What's coming up on Eminem, Paul? Well, this week, I shall be heading to the Wild West in the company of someone I've not had on the show, but someone I've wanted to speak to for quite a long time, the author, John LeMay, who's written a fabulous series. Uh, usually about cowboys and aliens. And his latest book is Cowboys and Monsters, which includes lots of vintage reports of people in the Wild West across the uh, 1850s to the early 1900s encountering vampires, mummies, werewolves, dinosaurs, and more. Okay. I love it. And where can everyone find you online? So you can find Mysteries and Monsters at all good homes of podcasts and where they live as well as finding Mysteries and Monsters across all social media platforms, including YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Brilliant. I'm on Twitter and Instagram as Largely the Truth. You can find my podcast, Largely the Truth, with Brent in store, everywhere fine podcasts live. It is on hiatus till the fall, but there are uh, multiple episodes there, 20 some episodes to keep you occupied till then. You can also find the web stream I do with Joseph Camo, Weird Together, and that's on YouTube. You can catch it live or you can catch it after the fact. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. As we said at the top of the show, if you guys want to become patrons, we would certainly, certainly appreciate it. Uh, Lord knows it's going to take me a while to pay off this vacation I'm going on here at the end of the month. 
And you can uh, help me out with that at patreon.com slash ghost story guys. Again, that's patreon.com slash ghost story guys. We have all kinds of physical and digital rewards. You get access to not only an ad free feed, but all the bonus shows. You get host adventures, book of the dead. You get early access to the main shows. You get also access to episodes of me and Paul, the sunken library, so many other things. And you get access to the wonderful community of people that we have there. A lot of cool folks on Patreon. Um, and actually, I just uploaded uh, a 20 minute talk on podcasting that I had originally done for the Wisdom app. So, you know, if you're thinking of starting a podcast, you want to hear Bren's harsh but fair reality of what podcasting is like, you can get that at patreon.com slash ghost story guys. Now, ordinarily, this would be where we do the Ghost Force shout outs as well, but uh, it is very late. And so we're going to do that once I'm back from LA. So that, um, that, that is when that will happen. But thank you to all the members of ghost force. You will get a badass, a, a badass. Thank you. I promise. Once I am <laughs> back on, once I'm back on Canadian ground. And, uh, <laughs> if you are in the Los Angeles area, it may be possible to meet up while I'm down there. Send us an email, ghost guys at gmail.com. And we shall see. I'm down there with a the family, but I do have a couple days to myself. So if we can make it happen, we will. And, uh, we shall see. If you want to get in touch, the show is on Facebook and Twitter as Ghost Story Guys. We are on Instagram as The Ghost Story Guys. And we are on Reddit as r slash Ghost Story Guys podcast. But if you have a story to tell, best way to do it is to shoot us an email, ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. We're going to be doing more listener stories episodes again once I'm back. So we would love to hear your comments, your questions, and of course, your spooky stories. And if you don't want to type, you can always call the ghost line. There's something strange in your neighborhood. We're gonna call ghost line. Call one triple eight five eight eight six nine two zero. That's right. That's one triple eight five eight eight six nine two zero. Leave your comments questions or stories as one or a series of voicemails. I think the tops out at three minutes, but you can call back as many times as you want. You won't be disturbing anyone. And we very much want to hear what you have to say. Again, that's one 888 6920 Any news, Paul? Anything coming up? The Paranormal Pendle episode is finally out. Oh, brilliant. Okay. <laughs> so check that as I talk about some of my favorite spooky hauntings in Sheffield. Fantastic. I'll put a link to that in the show notes, and I will also link it at ghoststoryguys.com. Don't forget, what if you ever want to check out all the shows that Paul and I have guested on, it's all indexed on our blog at ghoststoryguys.com. And I don't think I have any news aside from the things I've said. Just a reminder that our, our series of audio dramas is beginning next week, July 19th, with The Dive by Brianna Morgan. And that will be a semi-regular series. Uh, we've got three lined up so far. And if people respond to it, if they like it, then we will do more. But uh, again, we're going to, the first one will be out next week. And that will be The Dive, originally written by Brianna Morgan and adapted by yours truly. And of course, featuring our friend, our good friend here, Paul, Lord of the Cats. Thank you very much. Yes. Our bumper music was composed by Rainy Days for Ghosts. Rainy Days for Ghosts is the project of composer and film journalist Jerry Smith. Jerry's located in Southern California. And if you would like to commission him for music of your own, send him an email at rainydaysforghosts at gmail.com. You can also find his other music at rainydaysforghosts.bandcamp.com. Our theme song, Radio, Into the Darkness We Go, is composed and performed by Peter Kursov of Pizzanta Music. Find more from him at Night Harvest Recordings or by searching for Pizzanta Music wherever you get your tunes. Our stories theme is The Future Belongs to Them Now by Hexagram. Find more from them by searching for Hexagram wherever you get your music. I guess that's going to do it. Well then, we'll be back in two weeks. But until then, into the darkness we go.
You laughing in that voice is scary, actually. <laughs> is it really? <laughs> <laughs> That's it, isn't it? No, next page. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I did wonder. He was ad-libbing. Interesting. Okay. What do you think happened, Natalie Wood? I, th- I think Robert Wagner killed her. Without a shadow of a doubt. Mental health this, mental health that. I'm like, well, maybe you need to investigate that a little bit. <laughs> Never unraveled that particular mystery. No, no, that's always a strange conundrum. Uh, speaking of Black Sabbath and, and Iron Iron Maiden, <laughs> there is a, I, I, that's right, folks. Rock this talk. is a rock talk with Paul and Bren. <laughs> <laughs> there is a brilliant cover of uh, Sabbath Bloody Sabbath by Godspeed and Bruce Dickinson. It is fucking, again, Great. Sabbath Lady Sabbath is a great song anyways, but covered by these guys, it just kind of brings it to the modern era with a little more crunch. Mm. So good. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> Get off the stage. <laughs> Again. By the way, just apropos of nothing, uh, this is either going to go way over time or we're going to have to record some stuff tomorrow. Where, where, where are you at? I'm good. I'm all okay. right. For our listeners who are unsure, that is UK colloquialism oh, for so, cigarettes. Yeah. <laughs> so you'd have a ten- Yeah, let's change that. 